But I did see, I think I saw some beads of sweat rolling down Moki's face when uh, Ryan said six he had a figures, six man. figure swing Dead. in one weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you know how hard I worked for six figures, man. <laughs> I worked. I didn't work very hard for mine. <laughs> yeah, well, th- again, the market did the work. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Bitcoin Cash podcast. Following Bitcoin Cash on its rise to global reserve currency, today is Tuesday, the twenty fifth of May, two thousand and twenty one. My name is Jeremy. I'm your host. And today, no guest. Why? Because we're doing another uh, debate commentary. I have previously done a commentary on the Kim.com BCH versus BDC debate. And also uh, in a previous episode, talked about the Peter versus Spencer Schiff debate. So everybody knows I (laughs) I love debates. Uh, And I saw there's one recently that Ryan Giffen, who is a cryptocurrency advocate and Bitcoin Cash supporter um, did did a debate uh, yesterday and he was a guest on the show a couple weeks ago. Uh, uh, so I'll link, to, I'll link to that. That was episode uh, 15, I think it might have been, um, with him, the one about Peter and Spencer Schiff. Uh, so when I saw he, up, he has this uh, debate, I thought, well, uh, this will be a banger. So I sat down to watch it. And as I was just starting to get into it, I thought, you know what, why not just uh, record it with my, my thoughts as I was going along and turn it into a podcast episode. So the premise basically, uh, which we'll see in a second, is that uh, Ryan is kind of arguing that cryptocurrency is going to grow and take over the world a little bit. And the guy on the other side, who's called Moki Finance, who I've, I've never heard of uh, before uh, is, is kind of the opposite case that crypto is kind of going to fade away. And the debate moderator is this guy, the Rituation Room, who I guess Ryan or Moki Finance or maybe both of them know and trust because they asked him to be the moderator. So just before we get back to, back to that, let's just quickly check in on the price. So Bitcoin Cash today, $688.63, uh, which means it's about... 54 to 1 BTC to uh, BCH to BTC. So we always got to gotta get that in there for the historical record. But as for this debate, uh, so I have not seen this. I watched about the first one minute uh, before I realized maybe I should do this uh, commentary. So I'm going to be putting in <laughs> my, my thoughts uh, right as the as the debate progresses obviously i'm basically backing ryan's side i'm uh, you know un- undoubtedly going to be uh you know supporting his points um that cryptocurrency is going to take over and sort of try to poke holes in the in the other side of the argument so i'm clearly i'm clearly biased in that respect yeah nobody should expect me to be impartial in that but i think it will be interesting to see whether i perhaps uh you know have slightly different uh takes to ryan or whether there is anything in the uh fiat currency side of the argument that that i'm not expecting or, or which you know can be acknowledged as a good point because there are there are definitely good points to be had crypto while fantastic is obviously not flawless so let's um Let's let's crack on with it and uh, just start the debate here. Man, there, there will be fireworks for sure. <laughs> I think we might just need to get going. Um, yeah, just let it. I think that's the way we go. Yeah, we'll let okay. it. Go. I'm ready. Cool. Sweet. Well, um, I'm just going to act like there's a million people watching. So for everybody mm-hmm. watching, really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, very thankful for Moki and Ryan. They were kind of the ones that... Uh, reached out to me actually to moderate this debate. First time moderating a live debate. Obviously, I've talked to both these guys, I think at least twice on my podcast. So um, very familiar with them, familiar with their viewpoints. And uh, we're just going to jump into this. I'm just going to kind of work as a moderator and make sure that people kind of get their time to talk. I might interject with specific questions, maybe challenging each of their cases. And uh, other than that, we'll just kind of go from there. I am going to jump into quick intros. So on the bull side of today's crypto argument, uh, we have Ryan, 
Uh, Ryan's a business owner, entrepreneur, and runs a finance and investing YouTube channel. He's an early investor in cryptocurrencies, um, specifically Ethereum. I think what at like 120 or 150, right? I, I chased it from 300 down to 90, so I'm used to the volatility. Okay, cool. Uh, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin, and then maybe a few others that I'm unaware of. But he's a huge advocate for cryptocurrency and the potential that it has to take over the finance world. So that's kind of what we're looking at with Ryan Giffen. On the bear side, we have Moki. Um, Moki is an entrepreneur and runs a YouTube channel, Moki Finance. He actually recently quit his day job and has been pursuing his channel and his channel outlets kind of full time. Uh, Moki is an advocate for index fund investing and has invested zero of his own money into cryptocurrency. I know Ryan over there maybe gifted him some Bitcoin cash, but we'll uh, put that to the side. Uh, he's a non-believer and thinks investing in these assets can be dangerous. So that's going to be kind of our, our going in game plan here. All right. So right off the bat, yeah, like I said, I don't know who this uh, Moki Finance guy at all. So I have no idea what he's really going to bring to the table. But if he's a big uh, fan of index funds, uh, that is potentially the safest and most boring of asset classes uh, in the world. So clearly he's going to be very strongly opposed to cryptocurrency on the volatility uh, kind of front. And I mean, p personally, I think index funds are probably about the worst thing you can possibly uh, buy. You're most likely just going to get your value eaten away by inflation. And it is essentially a hands-off uh, position where it's kind of like, I don't know what to buy. So I'm going to buy something that just has a little bit of everything and sort of hope for the best. So very passive or very risk averse investors uh, traditionally go for index funds, right? So like, you know, retirees or people who are coming to the end of their working career, or maybe people who don't know very much about investing. So they just think, look, I'll just go with whatever the, the market wants to go with. Or, I mean, obviously you can also have some use for them in terms of if you believe in a, a particular, um, you know, sector, perhaps like you might get the index fund for uh, tech stocks because you think all of the tech industry is, is going to do well. So there is some utility to those kind of things, but personally, I'm not a, a big fan, but I, I can see what cryptocurrency is pretty much diametrically opposed to index funds. Uh, so this should be should be a good uh, debate, really. Oh, and also, uh, it was just funny that <laughs> Ryan uh, obviously managed to give uh, Moki Finance a little a little bit of Bitcoin Cash before uh, before the show here. So that's already uh, spicing it up because in the real world, well, there you go. Crypto is already winning the debate. If this guy didn't have crypto before and he's got some now, well, at the very least, he's one step closer to understanding um, what's going on. And that might be a theme maybe that in anti-crypto arguments is often they come from a point of just not understanding the, the technology uh, or not having much experience with it. So they're kind of at a natural disadvantage uh, when they debate it as like, you know, with Peter Schiff uh, previously kind of, uh, kind of the same. But on the other hand, you know, good on him. He's obviously uh, open-minded. Uh, at the very least, uh, if, if, if he was willing to get some and, and kind of see see what it was about a little bit. So uh, good, good, good start there for the Bitcoin Cash side. Fellas, for uh, starting off, I'm going to put a number on my calculator on my phone. And uh, Ryan, you are the one who's not in the Midwest, so we'll call you the away team. Go ahead and call uh, even or odds, and I'll show you my phone. I'm not going to do anything fancy, so even or odds. Uh, even. Okay. It's an eight, so would you like to go first on opening arguments or second? Um, I I'll go first. Okay. Whenever. All right. Well, so traditionally in, a, in most debate formats that at least I'm aware of, the affirmative side does, does start, so I don't know whether the moderator wasn't aware of that or... You know, that's just how he wanted to run the debate. Fair enough. Uh, but Ryan is on the affirmative side and going first. So all is right in the world. Are you ready? All right. All right. So, uh, yeah, my name is Ryan Giffen. I run a YouTube channel all about investing in different asset classes. And a big part of my investing thesis is built around cryptocurrency. I'm fascinated with the idea that for the first time in human history, any human can send any amount of money to anyone in the world 
for a fraction of a penny instantly, and nobody can stop it. I think that's the most powerful invention since really the internet and, and maybe even bigger than the internet. Um, since early man, people used to just trade physical goods. Like if you had a cow, you traded it for someone's sheep or whatever resource you needed. And then we needed to come up with a medium of exchange. We tried several mediums of exchanges and we ultimately from rocks to shells uh, and, and we eventually found precious metals, which did a great job for many years. Early people used to trade uh, gold and silver, but when it became too cumbersome to store their value, they would actually leave it at the goldsmith and trade the paper value of their gold. It became so effective that government started adopting it. And that's when things started to become a bit dishonest. Uh, the, the early Roman Empire used to use gold and silver, and they would actually put base metals into that. And that's where the actual term that comes, that we still use today, debasing the currency, the Federal Reserve debased the currency, actually stems from governments putting base metals into precious metals. Uh, move forward many centuries later, uh, you have uh, governments still using it, and it's, it works as, as a restraint in the United States. People use gold and silver uh, as their reserve for the United States back until really 1913 is when we got the Federal Reserve Act, when things started to change. And it wasn't until, uh, it wasn't until, did we lose Moki? Looks like we lost Moki. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll carry on. It, it okay. wasn't until uh, President Roosevelt in 1933 uh, set out the Gold Compensation Act. And what he did, he took everyone's gold, made it illegal to own gold so we could get rid of the gold market. And what they did is they price fixed the cost of gold to $25. And they did this for several years so the government could be a little bit more dishonest in their money. They price fixed it. So it, this worked well until 1971 when foreign governments were, uh, were demanding to be paid in gold rather than paper. So what we actually have in 1971 is probably the biggest thesis to own uh, cryptocurrency now. We, when we moved away from the gold standard and went to a paper currency, the wealth gap in this country has, has spread by the top 1% holding 99% of the wealth. And the reason being is because government has no restraint and can print as much currency as possible. And this is great if you are holding assets. So holding an asset like stocks and real estate and now cryptocurrency made you exponentially wealthier. But if you were poor, the government printing away your money made you poorer. Because uh, you were just paying for your goods and services and didn't have a good store of wealth. So this is where it, this allows any human the opportunity to store value and not be printed away by any government, not only in the United States. Uh, we, we trust in cryptocurrency the rules of mathematics, not the whims of politicians. Uh, we believe that we can stop war with this because most, most wars are, are fought with inflation, printed dollars. This can make the world a more peaceful place. It can make doing business easier. And that's why you're going to see massive amount of adoption. Right now, we currently sit at about a $1.5 trillion asset class. And it certainly is volatile in nature, but the definite trend is up. It's been the best performing asset of the last decade. And Bitcoin in the last three years has outperformed the stock market every single year since it crashed in 2018. In 2019, it outperformed the stock market in 2020, and it is doing the same in 2021. And... Um, and while volatile in nature, uh, a lot of that is predicated on Bitcoin's halving cycle, which takes place every four years. So what that means is Bitcoin halves its mineable supply every four years. It was just a pre-written code. And it's actually ingenious in a way because that's what's created the mania. Uh, if Bitcoin just inflated its 21 million supply that it'll eventually be uh, every hour, you would not have these huge run-ups in price. But that also wouldn't have made it quite the mania that it is and becoming the fastest asset class to reach $1 trillion in market value. It took Google 22 years to become a $1 trillion company. It took Apple 40 years to be a $1 trillion company. It only took Bitcoin and cryptocurrency 12 years. Uh, this trend is likely to continue because currency is currently over a $100 trillion asset. Storing value is extremely important and transacting value is extremely important. And uh, the last little case I'll make is uh, it also helps with freedom of press. Uh, Julian Assange has uh, been prosecuted and thrown in embassies and jails and, and tried to censor him for telling truths about what goes on in the world. And he's been shut down by PayPal, Visa, any other central authority, any central point of attack. That's what cryptocurrency doesn't have is a central point of attack. We have 10,000 nodes that operate in over 100 countries. 
that the only way you can shut down the Bitcoin network is to go after these 10,000 nodes and kill these uh, kill these people and go to every country, go to the top of Russia and, and go to Hawaii and go to Africa. You would need to do all that. But you can shut down people by using Visa and PayPal. So he operates by being able to accept cryptocurrency and keep the freedom of press still alive. So it is to me, and there's many other use cases for it in smart contracts, decentralized finance, even notaries can store information on it. Even artists can publish finite art by saying that, by putting a digital token on a blockchain, saying that this is the first one to ever be created. This is going to be the most powerful and largest asset class in humanity. And while it may go down, it may go up in the short term, in the long run, the early adopters will be rewarded handsomely. That's my opening statement. Right. So, you know, it's very, very strong opening salvo there from from Ryan. We ended up with a bit of a grab bag of everything. We've got the, I mean, it is opening statements, I suppose. So we've got the history of money that kind of got a mention in. Got uh, WikiLeaks, obviously very important in cryptocurrency history for proving that it was a decentralized uh, project or uncensorable medium of exchange and that uh, that was kind of a point where governments might have been trying to stop it down, but obviously they couldn't uh, in 2011. So it's only got more uh, decentralized, more spread about, more cryptos, more adopters and, and harder to attack since then. So. Obviously, the yeah, the trend has been up and up. Uh, you can already, you know, see that Ryan has somewhat uh, kind of conceded on the on the volatility point because he can obviously tell that that's going to be a, a big point of attack. I it'll be interesting to see, you know, uh, what uh, Moki Finance says, but I I I wouldn't even necessarily take take the same strategy as as Ryan on that point. I wouldn't. Kind of say well it's volatile but in the long run it's going to be good i would maybe go the other way and say the volatility is essential to its success and is one of the most misunderstood aspects of uh of cryptocurrency in the sense that the fact that you can speculate in those manias which which ryan did uh hint at is a huge driver of uh, adoption and helps that it be a self-fulfilling prophecy that it will spread uh, to everyone so we'll 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 see what uh, what the response here from from Moki Finance. All right, thank you, Ryan. Uh, looks like we got a lot more people in the chat, so that's good to see. Um, just for everyone who missed it, Moki's going to be giving his side of the story, which is going to be the bear case. So Ryan will be uh, defending cryptocurrency today, and Moki will be uh, going against it. So Moki, whenever you're ready, you can start your opening statement. Absolutely. And before I start, I just want to say Ryan is 10 times smarter than me when it comes to <laughs> cryptocurrencies. I don't have all those facts that he just laid down. So, but I do. Have well, there you go. That, that really just says it all. As I predicted, the uh, crypto bear case, usually not coming from a position of understanding, the, you know, to, to, argue, to argue against a case, usually you need a steel matter. You need to understand your opponent's side of the case almost as well or as well as you understand your own because otherwise you know you don't really have a, you're just arguing from ignorance so it seems like we're already seeing a bit of a tacit acknowledgement of that bad facts tonight so in my opening statement guys i'm just going to take you back uh, 10 short years um 10 10 short years ago where there was no cryptocurrency where there was a world that was just coming out of a great all right okay so technically already inaccurate uh Cryptocurrency has now been around since 2009, so a little over 12 years. But uh, we'll we'll give that a pass. I I know what he's I know what he's saying. So 15 years ago, let's say financial depression and index funds in those last 10 years before cryptocurrency came about have been the best asset class. Now I understand since Bitcoin has really started its run up. I understand the 300, 400, 1000 percent gains have uh, basically taken taken a hold of a mania that we have seen before. This isn't the first time mania has occurred. And I mean, yet again, a, a little bit uh, a little bit off in the numbers there. If you're arguing from the start of Bitcoin's existence, you know, at one cent, it's done a lot more than uh, a thousand percent it is like well over a hundred thousand you know we're in the millions of percentage 
uh, points in terms of uh, gains if you really want to go right back to the start. But yeah, okay. But I understand his point again that it's made very, very large gains that you wouldn't expect in traditional index funds or whatever. This isn't the first time that it's actually occurred on virtual assets. So the internet bubble in the 2000s had the same exact run up. You had a lot of speculation. You had a lot of people that knew the price of everything but the value of nothing. So 10 years ago, what was the value of this cryptocurrency market? It was non-existent. It just came to form. Currently, the cryptocurrency market sits at a $1.5 trillion market cap. There's over 10,000 individual coins that you can buy on the market with over 380 exchanges. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you this thing is not growing. It's absolutely growing. But like all manias, they do have a peak. And I believe that thinking that you can virtually hold an asset and act that it stores value when in return it goes down 20 to 30 percent in a day is never going to be a good store of value. The reason people like asset classes that stored value such as gold or silver or precious metals, because those did really well in times where the market or the times where interest rates were really high and the market was underperforming. But as soon as the market turns back around, assets like those usually underperform the market over a longer period of time. Now, I'm not predicting here what Bitcoin or what any other cryptocurrency will do, but historically, I've never been one to speculate. Um, I never invested in any type of investments that would go up or down in value by somebody sending a tweet or by somebody's appearance on Saturday Night Live or by a hashtag on social media. To me, well, hang on, wait, wait, wait up, hold up a second here. I mean, the, he's, this is a little bit, um, how do you say it? Not disingenuous, really, but saying I've never invested in anything that goes up or down. Uh, because of tweets like index funds, which comprise large stock companies, definitely are affected by tweets. If Elon Musk uh, tweets about Tesla and sends his stock to the moon, well, then that drags up the the you know price of index funds. So it's not the fact that information in the marketplace doesn't affect index funds so much at, as it affects it less. It do obviously doesn't have the extremes of cryptocurrency but that's mostly because cryptocurrency is quite new. So it's really a question of degree rather than a question of, um, you know, binary difference that index funds are not affected by Twitter or by, uh, you know, appearances in the, in the media by, you know, people involved uh, so much as it's just a lot, a lot less. And I think he also did sort of miss the point about gold uh, that, yeah, okay, gold overperforms in a time of crisis and underperforms, you know, in a time uh, of relative economic uh, growth uh, compared to, you know, safe, stable index funds. But on the other hand, gold is also good when your government <laughs> goes into hyperinflation, uh, which might not be a reality. Well, maybe it is, but uh, which maybe has not recently, you know, occurred in in America, but it certainly does occur in a, a lot of parts of the world. Uh, so, for those uh, investors, maybe the index funds of the Venezuelan stock exchange not looking so, look, not looking so hot when all the uh, real value just melts away um, as the fiat currency price uh, skyrockets. So, really, if you're arguing when times are good, index funds are good. Yeah, but the problem is when times are bad, they're literally worthless and they don't survive the transition to the to the next phase of the economy at all. So uh, that's certainly a huge downside risk, which I think probably is going to get overlooked. That's speculation. I learned from one of the greats in investing. I learned from Jack Bogle and I read all of his material. And if anything, Jack Bogle taught me was to be patient and to ignore all the noise around you. The only thing that really works with investing is having time on your side. It looks like in these times, in these markets, people are trading 24 seven and we've seen cryptocurrencies crash overnight, literally overnight. You wake up the next day and you're down 15, 20%. I can't picture in my portfolio, in the portfolio that I worked so hard for, I can't picture it going down 20, 30%. I know some people can and that's absolutely perfectly fine but I personally can't. So today, I'm gonna to bring you some of my biggest bear cases against cryptocurrencies. I'm not gonna really attack on any specific coin. I actually, in the long run, do believe there will be coins like Bitcoin, and Ryan has actually convinced me 
in the Bitcoin cash that he's sending, how easy it is to actually transact that money. Within milliseconds, we can have access to that money and there's basically no transactional cost. So I'm not gonna argue those points, but I will argue points that this market is in a mania and this market's overpriced and that eventually over 80% of this, and I think Ryan, you'll believe the same, eventually over 80% of this market, if not more, will get wiped out. And I think the coins that end up staying behind or, or what's left of the market after that crash uh, will really determine what the future of this market is. But I personally can't have anybody that follows me or anybody that does investing, uh, I can't endorse them putting their money in something like this that uh, can get wiped out overnight. Okay, interesting. All right. Well, this is a bit of a, a good take. At least he hasn't gone with the Peter Schiff angle that is all cryptocurrency is worthless and it's all going to zero, basically. Uh, it is actually fairly balanced uh, to say that, okay, maybe the crypto market is overvalued right now and it is going to be due in for a big correction. A lot of crappy coins are going to suffer a lot. Even good coins are going to suffer uh, somewhat and obviously uh, experiencing trading cryptos with, with Ryan has, um, has, you know, <laughs> shown him that, uh, there is like at least some, some utility, uh, to it. So actually already this, you know, I, I've got to applaud him for, for his, uh, take. And it does make sense that his, uh, his, you know, he, he doesn't want to be encouraging that on his, on his channel. If it is like we say, focus on investment funds, um, that in the, in the manner of having investment funds, you would be attracting an audience of very safe, conservative investors. So obviously advocating cryptocurrency is not going to be, uh, re you know, receptive or, or appropriate for them necessarily. Whereas Ryan is of course in the opposite position where because he is focused on cryptocurrency, he's got an audience that is willing to buy into having that kind of, uh, volatility. And it's interesting that, uh, Mo finance says, well, the, the great thing that uh, investors have on their side uh, is is time and patience and that's actually i would say a very strong argument for cryptocurrency because over a five or a seven year period cryptocurrencies do phenomenally well uh, well at least the ones that survive um, do like bitcoin i don't think it's possible to have ever bought bitcoin and be in the red five to seven years later it, it just doesn't happen because the, the growth is so tremendous. And even with even if you pick the absolute worst points in terms of the peak and the dips in those years, if there's enough time, uh, crypto tends to do very, very, very well. So I think if, if he thought through his argument a little bit more, like if you wanted to hold for 15 years, you know, a basket of major cryptos versus an index fund, I mean, the cryptos would be a Sure, it would be a sure bet, <laughs> I, I would say. But uh, obviously, you know, the fact that it might be up or down 20% on, on one day uh, is too scary uh, for him and for his audience, which kind of is contradictory because if you're, if you're worried about a short-term volatility, well, then you're not being a patient long-term investor. And if being a patient long-term investor is so important and is the key, then some short of volatility, you shouldn't just paper hands <laughs> and sell out. But uh, it seems, uh, anyway, whatever, he's got those uh, two points. Ryan, any immediate thoughts on that? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the volatile nature is one that, uh, that, that comes with the, uh, that's the cost you pay for outperformance. Uh, just because something is volatile doesn't mean it's bad. And a lot of times, early assets, uh, they um, it, think in terms, I like the analogy, a small boat in a big ocean will rock uh, more than a big boat in a big ocean. So as market cap rises, uh, the volatility will die down, but the gains that you can make will be less. So you must accept that. Bitcoin used to bounce from 2 to $10 a day, 80% swings. We're doing much better with 30% swings. Uh, in March last year, the stock market fell. Uh, I, I see a comment here of, Banks fell 10% overnight. If you went to a gas station six months ago, uh, your dollars went down against gas prices by 50%. And yet people aren't yelling at their dollars and uh, they're not giving all their dollars away, but they should. They should be doing it for cryptocurrency in the long run. But I do follow something. And if you follow my channel, I follow it almost uh, in a religious sense is the troll.
So yeah, quality point about the decline of the dollar versus oil. That's a, that's a bit of a spicy angle. I, uh, I like, uh, I like getting that one in there. Bullet chart. I don't try to get too caught up in the noise. And I do agree with Jack Vogel's assessment of the market is be careful of the noise. Uh, I, I look at terms of what is the fair market value of cryptocurrency, and I predicate that on its medium value. Its medium value, what it overall trades to. So I use something called the Trollo chart that calls a median value price for cryptocurrency, and I buy when we make lows against that, particularly in the bull and the bear market. That's how you buy Ethereum for $100. Uh, if you're chasing coins named after dogs uh, and you get hurt, uh, you must accept the risk of that. Uh, also, not too much of a jab at Dogecoin as, as Elon Musk, if he wants to make that a great cryptocurrency. Uh, it's just like the Buccaneers signing Tom Brady. They can turn into a great team too, possibly. I'm not saying that'll happen or not. Uh, so while volatile in nature, uh, you will get rewarded in the thesis that this is a great investment by being an early adopter. Only 4% of the world has touched cryptocurrency yet. Uh, I believe diffusions of innovation theory uh, really gives way to the massive market adoption when about 15% of the people touch it, and then you get like the, you know, the the, the real adoption, and then uh, and then everyone and you later had the laggards. Everyone eventually will touch cryptocurrency. It's just when, and at what price. I so I'll counter that. So I don't think that's true that everybody will touch it. So he, let me from the point that I'm coming from is, I was never a forex trader, so I never tra traded physical currencies because of the fact that it's trading. It's a 24-hour market where even though Forex is heavily regulated by the government, um, there's, it's very difficult to pull off scams or market ma manipulations when you're a Forex trader. You're still trading, and I did not like the aspect of trading. That's why I never held anything like that in my portfolio. Cryptocurrency, to me, is just a digital form of Forex trading. I can't understand the fact that if, for example, a market's open 24-7, 365, that you can comfortably say that it cannot be manipulated when it's not governed by anybody. There is no, I understand the whole point of Bitcoin is so that there is no central bank or there's no central government that can control it. But at the same time, in the roaring 20s, before the stock market was really regulated, speculation ran rampant and people were being manipulated. There were stocks that were being driven up that had no business being driven up. Just like we see in today, we see coins being driven up, as you mentioned, Dogecoin, but I got Shiba Inu, Mooncoin, I mean, I got Moki coin. you guys trying to invest? I mean, I got it. So when you see these things uh, being driven up uh, to, to prices that uh, can't be, I mean, for example, Dogecoin with a market cap sits at about 75%. It's bigger than 75% of the companies in the S&P 500 just by market cap alone. So when you start thinking about things like that, and that's a coin that I know nobody here hopefully uh, believes in, but that's a coin that ha sits now sixth biggest in the crypto space. So it's a coin that if you were an early adapter, you're probably a millionaire, but at the same time, it's a coin now that these young investors are really starting to get behind to believe in. And I think those are the investors that are going to lose the most and they're going to be hurt the most because they're backing things that uh, don't have intrinsic values. There's no way to put a value on something like that. I, as far as I know, uh, you, got, you guys can correct me, but as far as I know, Dogecoin is not uh, really you. I mean, I know you can uh, trade it back and forth and you can hold it in your wallets and all that, but what is the physical use for that uh, outside of uh, people saying that it can be used like cash? I don't ever see that happening. I don't see me transacting in Dogecoin or uh, Fortune 500 companies accepting these things as payments. I know I've heard stories of certain companies that are, but I can't put a, a physical use on that. And probably I would say two or three coins so far out of this entire 10,000, uh, you can convince me that there's going to be a physical use for them. Unfortunately, those three coins, they don't control, they do control 50, 60% of the market, but they're not the entire market. Uh, so I'm more worried about people that are speculating into these smaller meme coins that are going to get hurt really bad. And I think, Right, okay. So, I mean, a very kind of bit of a mixed uh, argument here as well, too. On one hand, he starts by saying, look, it's not, you know, Ryan has a good point that it's going to inevitably everybody is going to get involved. It's really just a question of where on the adoption curve uh, each individual falls, right? Uh, and then the response kind of is, look, I don't think that's inevitable at all. 
and then he goes after Dogecoin and other meme coins. And then it kind of has this weird pivot where he says, yeah, but the larger cryptocurrencies, maybe they would actually get accepted or maybe there is evidence that these will become a sort of a, a tradable asset. And unfortunately for him in this debate, he's not even arguing against Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum or even Dogecoin. He's arguing the entire crypto market. Uh, he's bearish on the whole thing. So Ryan's obviously got plenty of ammo there because from Ryan's point of view, only one coin needs to come good for crypto to have been a success in the long run. Uh, and it can have been any of those coins. So obviously uh, Moki Finance is trying to look out for his own uh, channel listeners and stuff and not you know advising them not to get sucked into the Dogecoin hype. And he has also correctly identified that with uh, Dogecoin and with many other coins, the the ninety nine percent of the value comes from literally just speculative gambling. But the fundamental thesis underneath that is that for Dogecoin or for Bitcoin Cash or for any other crypto, the the speculation that's going on is some kind of betting on the likelihood that that one coin is the coin that go, then goes on to be mass adopted and becomes a huge uh, global hit, right? So that's why if, if there's maybe not a lot of use at, at retailers right now for Dogecoin, there's actually more uh, than zero. So there's obviously some kind of value there, maybe not to the extent of the uh, market cap it's got, it's got now. It's mostly driven by hype, but there's at least some kind of value. And then for other coins such as Bitcoin Cash, which are more accepted in a lot of different places, well, that's what a physical uh, use case might, you know, is what uh, I think he... Is basically referencing there. So kind of, kind of interesting that again, he's uh, Moki Finance has conceded that crypto does have some uh, use or that the larger coins are actually probably going to survive the next bear crash and uh, come back, come back good, but uh, definitely, you know, a, a strange angle to take to only go after uh Dogecoin when he's supposed to kind of debunk the entire crypto market. Just to jump in quickly, for the sake of argument tonight, I my assumption, Ryan, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, but I don't think anybody here is really advocating for Dogecoin or SafeMoon or any of these. So um, in terms of that kind of stuff, like, yeah, I think most of us would agree here that's bad for everybody, uh, unless you're one of the people that bought it, you know, hundredth fraction of a cent or whatever it was. So uh, I'd prefer we don't go down that route because I think we probably all agree that that stuff's probably bad for the crypto market. I, I don't know how Ryan feels about it, but I feel it's bad for the crypto market. It's bad for really all the asset classes because it kind of dilutes everything. Um, Ryan, I don't know if you want to quickly touch on that, but I, I'd like to stick to just like strictly the, the main cryptos uh, and then we'll kind of go from there. Interesting. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say Dogecoin is bad for crypto. I would say it's actually amazing for crypto. Obviously, a lot of people are going to invest in it and screw up and a lot of people are going to get hurt. But uh, what Dogecoin does, well, firstly, it proves that crypto is a free market and that anybody can make any kind of coin and that's perfectly valid. And if it rises up the ranks, well, it rises up the ranks. That's just how it goes. That's, that's the free market. I love it. But uh, even beyond that, I think Dogecoin has done a huge service to the crypto industry as a whole because it's made it a bit more meme friendly and especially back in the day when it was invented crypto was very very strongly associated with you know the dark net markets illegal trading blah 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 that was more of the narrative from the mainstream media at the time so when Dogecoin came out uh, and initially became popular and then later on uh, now it has just you know demonstrated to the world that cryptocurrency could could be anything and could take any form it could even just be a joke right uh so that that's kind of uh it's like the marketing department uh of uh cryptocurrencies is dogecoin in terms of opening up uh new frontiers of investors so i think dogecoin is actually great and if young investors buy a little bit and lose a little bit and then you know well that sucks but that's that's how you learn in the in the markets is you invest and you make some make some bad deals, right? That's just essential. That's always the way it's going to be. So uh, I actually think Dogecoin is great, but we'll see what uh, Ryan's take is here. Yeah, um, like I believe in people's uh, right to do stupid things though. Um, I don't believe in protecting people from themselves. I believe in teaching people to think critically and analytically. 
and I believe in uh, uh, free markets and, and uh, competition of currency. And um, I believe the cream rises to the top and, and, and I do advocate for people to make better decisions, but I will not force them to. And let's say, let's say for example, what, what if you know, we, when in this more monolithic type currency system, you are, you, there's been a coercive push towards one currency that inflates, uh, like Dogecoin, actually the dollar inflates faster than that. And I'm not saying Dogecoin is better or worse than the, the dollar, but it's, um, we, you are actually getting pushed a very bad currency on you. So that's, uh, that'd be my comeback to that and my, my thesis into it. So. so, yeah, and to be fair, I mean, there are stocks that, like we've seen in the past year, Nikola Motors kind of pumped a lot of air into the market and a lot of people believed in this thing and little did we know they were rolling a truck without an engine down the hill. So, um, and that thing probably had similar volatility for a little bit as some of these meme coins Maybe did. So yeah, so we see it across all asset classes. It just almost seems without the regulation and stuff within crypto, it's a little bit more dangerous, I would say kind of in that end. Um, talking about the volatility, I wanna kind of go both ways here. So first off, Ryan, for people like you that know the crypto market, you know what you're getting into, you know, you expect 50% pullbacks, maybe even more, and you might know to buy. How can you, as somebody who's just giving guidance to those who are a little bit less informed, kind of like how Moki was talking about, how can you justify somebody buying into a crypto? Let's say they bought Bitcoin at 55,000. That was their first exposure to cryptocurrency. And now they're freaking out as it's, you know, I think we're back at like 40. But what is your justification there? Do you really think that's the best way to introduce somebody into investing or how would you at least go about that process? Um, two answers. One is, and this has been my experience being in it. Uh, if, if, you, uh, if you're in investing into crypto and you go to the stock market, uh, I don't think you'll be bothered at all by the volatility. Your pain threshold for volatility will uh, be a lot stronger but that's not necessarily the case for it. Uh, the All right. Excellent point here by Ryan. I've heard so many people say this. I mean, I bought uh, stocks before I had, you know, ever bought uh, crypto and, and whatever. Um, and I would say almost certainly the same thing is true for, for Ryan and probably both of the guys on this call even being very financially interested, right? But you have a lot of uh, people now who... Uh, either got into investing uh, just more recently, or maybe they're quite young. Like you can you can trade cryptos probably before you can get an account to uh, trade trade stocks, right? So uh, that for them, they've kind of gone the other way. And I've definitely heard people say, "Oh, I you know got into cryptos and I was trading it a little bit, and then I went I tried to buy some stocks." I just was bored senseless that, you know, after being in crypto with 20% up or down in a day, you know, on the regular, like a stock moves, you know, 1% and everybody's freaking out, like, oh, big moves. Uh, they just thought this was completely, you know, <laughs> boring, right? So uh, that's, I think it's a good point by Ryan to, to mention and probably crypto investors would, would probably actually be uh, able to take a good advantage in that in the stock market because they would be able to handle a significant crash uh, without panicking in, a, in an asset that was that was actually fundamentally uh, strong in the long term. The I would tell people like right now I'm trying to really push my, my thesis right now. Like I, I believe we are still in a bull market, but there is also the opportunity that you're in a bull trap. Uh, and that that's something that you really have to think about and, and hedge your bet saying, what is the probability? And something I advocate all the time, and not a lot of people do it, and even I have to go sit down and do it, but I use the Kelly formula. Uh, the Kelly formula is a mathematical equation that lays out probability of outcome and, and rate of return. So, and it tells you how much your, your available capital you should allocate into that investment. It works fantastic in games of chance. And for me, I use longer term trends in the market of saying how I know I'm right, my probability of outcome. So I'm about 70 to 80 percent sure that we are still in a bull market and the market cap will exceed five trillion dollars this year. And that is we're only a one point five trillion dollar market. Uh, and I use that on prior trends on how far we go past the trend line. Um, and, and that's how I really move my amount of capital into the investment. I use the Kelly formula and say this is how much my net worth should be in it. 
And uh, and investors who have used this, like Warren Buffett, like uh, I can't believe the, I can't remember the first guy that introduced it to the market back in the '70s, but early professional, you know, uh, gamblers use this. And uh, it's it's uh, that's how I I would. It sounds crazy, but like there's two sides of this. There's the investment side of it, and then there's the utility in, in the world that it does. And um, and it's treated me very well. You know, I'm far outpacing the markets. Um, I have an overall 200% return on my portfolio because of it. And, um, but I do warn people at $5 trillion market cap, the risk to reward ratio is no longer anymore. It's, it's actually not favorable. And I would ad advocate for uh, a different asset class at that time, at, at least to have such a high exposure to. All right, Moki, uh, reaction to that, and then I have a follow-up for you. once. Yeah, I mean, that just sounds to me like a bunch of market timing. Um, use words like gambler and things like that. I mean, that just, and, uh, you know, saying that at $5 trillion, that is going to be, you know, where the market's going to crash. I think that's trying to time the market. Um, you guys know me. I'm never going to advocate for market timing. But the other case, Ryan, that you're saying with the bull trap, I think um, the last, you know, the first time I ever heard of Bitcoin, I'm sure, I don't know when you guys did, but it was 2017 when it did its big run up. And I remember reading a lot of stories back then of people that were saying that, you know, this thing was going to go to half a million or whatever the case may be, peaked out at 20,000, and then it lost something like 83% of its value over the next course of a year. It was a sl slow decline. It didn't just happen overnight. Uh, just kind of like what we're seeing now. I think April uh, when we saw the peak at 64, whatever, 63.5. Uh, since then, it's really been a slow decline. Yeah, we've seen peaks of, 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 of run-ups, but we've also seen volatility on the downward trend a lot more. I think anytime you see an asset class go down 50% almost, uh, which I know Bitcoin hasn't yet, it's 40, but uh, when you start approaching that territory, that to me, uh, in stock market speak, is, is not just a correction any longer. It's not a healthy correction. That is a straight, straight on crash. And uh, holding something like a Bitcoin asset, and we'll stick to Bitcoin, uh, holding just 5% of it in, in a pretty balanced portfolio, something that I talk about with index funds and bond funds all the time. If you had a 60-40 portfolio and you just added 5% of Bitcoin to your portfolio, your volatility would increase by 20%. That becomes very difficult for investors like myself who are long-term dollar cost average investors. You can't dollar cost average into a space that is going up and down 20%. What if you catch it on the wrong 20% and you catch Wait a second, wait, what? <laughs> this, this doesn't make any sense. In fact, crypto is a great place to dollar cost average. It's actually the, the perfect place to dollar cost average because of the high volatility. There's nothing stopping you taking your $200 that you want to invest in crypto, splitting it up over a four year period, and then putting in $1 a week that, you know, there's nothing that that's dollar cost averaging. That's what it is. And over, uh, you know, the life cycle of a huge crypto run and crash and spike and everything that would be perfect. So pretty weird argument to say that you can't dollar cost average into uh, cryptos. Um, but obviously he is, uh, making the point that because crypto is so volatile, it will add massive volatility to uh, somebody who is trying to have a very low volatility in their index portfolio. But as Ryan has already pointed out, it's volatile because it goes up and it goes up fast. So actually, you get better returns if you can kind of stomach that. But uh, interesting. But definitely you can dollar cost average into crypto. And in fact, it's highly recommended to dollar cost average into crypto. At the top, and then your dollar cost averaging buys at the top. And then for the next year, you're basically riding a, a sunken ship. So it can increase huge volatility to your portfolio. If you're somebody who's trying to retire early, yes, it could be a shortcut to retiring early, but it could also uh, prolong your early retirement by many decades if, if you invest wrong. And the last point, the biggest point that I have, and I think Ryan, you can attest to this, is if you invest in this asset class and you get lucky in the beginning, that could be the worst thing for you because this thing can take hold of your entire portfolio, can control something like 50, 60% if you experience some massive growth. You're not going to know the timing on when to get back out. Uh, you can look at 60 charts, you can look at 50 graphs, you can look at what Warren Buffett does. Unfortunately, the matter of fact is none of us know. And Thinking that we know is sometimes the biggest thing that uh, ends up damaging uh, our overconfidence bias is what, what ends up damaging our long-term performance. Quick question from Oki and then Ryan, you can respond to that. Um, a lot of talk about volatility, right? Volatility being an issue. 
Uh, do you not at the same time realize that, and I don't know what the exact index funds you're investing in, but a lot of the growth that you see in your index funds is based off of these large companies that went through a, a long series of, of lots of volatility. So you're still benefiting in the volatility. You're just, you're investing in a more diluted asset where you're not seeing it as much. C correct. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I own S and P 500 total market funds that own Tesla now. Right. And Tesla had crazy volatility and something. And Bitcoin. And, and, <laughs> and Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah. And it's just something, look, man, it comes down to this, right? If you're going to be, um, there's a very simple formula to building wealth, in my opinion. Um, there, You shouldn't try to reinvent the, the wheel, right? The wheel tells you it rolls forward. Jump on the freaking, uh, jump on the train and don't jump off. So other asset classes, I feel like you can't jump on the train and not jump off. People are almost incentivized to jump off. Bitcoin is one of them. And Ryan, you can attest to this. I'll ask you this right now with your uh, thesis on the five trillion market cap. If, if 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 the cryptocurrency market reaches the five to seven trillion that you're talking about, your plan is to jump off. What if it reaches the five to seven? You jump off and then it explodes from there. Well, what would you do in a scenario like that? All right. So just before we get to to Ryan's responses, I'm very very interested to hear what he has to say on this point because my. Uh, my thesis on, on cryptocurrency and my own personal experience of trading in and out of different coins has been that it hasn't basically worked out for me and that I'd always just have been better just accumulating coins and, and just letting them sit, you know, on a, on a longer time frame rather than trying to time the market, even with the, you know, troll oil charts and things, you know, even, even with uh, high quality investors like Mark DeMiesel in the crypto space that you can sort of listen to and, and they've done the analysis and the numbers. I'm, I'm kind of advocating the same strategy as Moki Finance here, which is get on the train and just don't get off. Uh, the only difference is that I think people should, you know, well, not investment advice basically, but uh, my own strategy, let's say, is to be involved in the cryptocurrency train and to just, yeah, not be, uh, not be getting off. So I think, the reason part of the reason for that strategy is that it's very hard to predict how fast cryptocurrency is going to take off and it constantly outperforms my own expectations so in that way if you just don't get off the train you never have a problem with missing out on a huge uh, run up obviously you suffer when there's also a huge dip but if your dollar costs averaging in that's not so much of a problem uh, ryan is more bent from the school of thought uh, that you know you should try and sell out at the right moment and then buy back in to maximize the amount of uh, your crypto holdings. So uh, it will be interesting to see his take here. So I, I think I may have thrown some people off when I talked about a formula people use for gambling, but uh, but it, it is helpful for, app, for asset allocation. And uh, I've allowed crypto to over allocate uh, my portfolio because you're not going to be able to make 2,500% returns within a year without doing that. Uh, you're, you're not going to make that by by not having high conviction and building a thesis around that. Um, but I, I, I think at that time, then we would I, I wouldn't completely go out of it. Um, I would I, I would probably move it more closer to five to 10 percent of my, my wealth at that level, uh, probably closer to five. And I understand people don't think like you can uh, time a market, do all things. And I know that's not necessarily for everyone. Uh, but I really believe if, if you look at the Bitcoin halving cycle and the four year nature of when this market is topping in 2013, 2017, 2021, it's happening a year after its halving cycle. So even if, if demand just stays constant for Bitcoin, uh, the supply cuts in half and the price only has one place to go. And I really believe in this asset class in some sort of timing it in terms of its relationship with its halving cycle. Because again, Demand just needs to stay steady. It doesn't even need to increase, which I believe it's going to increase demands for Bitcoin as the need for storing value uh, is more important. As cash has become a liability uh, with the inflation rate of 4.4% uh, this year, a company like Apple holding $200 billion worth of cash will bleed $10 billion. In Bitcoin, they don't have to go through this pain. Uh, they don't have to worry about a central authority taking away their purchasing power and no longer making cash a liability. And that's why you have companies like Tesla converting 8% of its balance sheet into cryptocurrency. And that's why you have a company like MicroStrategy pretty much going all in, which who knows, that could be overkill, but it's treated his shareholders very well. Uh, so that is, um, 
and so I think if you want to, people sometimes fall into this financial advisors will say past performance is not an indicator of future performance. That's a financial disclaimer. It's actually the best thing that we have. So not using it as a tool, um, or I, I should at least say using it as a tool has helped me. I don't want to say uh, it's not a good thing to do, but it's helped me. Now let's talk about inflation, Moki. So how do you view this? I mean, we're seeing what some are saying is to be a, an extreme inflationary period, obviously not extreme inflation, but I think you know the adjective I'm using there and how I'm trying to describe that. But uh, something like Bitcoin that has theoretically outperformed the market greatly, and if you're holding on, is about a 200% uh, annual return, is obviously going to keep you ahead of inflation. Things like index funds will still do that, right? But it's a lot less, and a 4% inflation is going to eat into your gains a lot more than something on, on the crypto side, at least speaking historically. So speak to a little bit about how you, how you view inflation and, and how you're combating that. Absolutely. Um, first of all, we can't speak historically on crypto when we only have a decade of data. So I can't talk historically on that. But absolutely. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you have inflation, like, I don't know if, again, I don't want to speculate. I, I'm not a big fan of speculating. But if we have inflation, anything like the 70s, our real return in the stock market's looking more like it might be flat or negative, right? So that, that's a real worry that I myself have as, as, as an investor in the stock market. So people do at times in an inflationary times, they look for safer asset classes that will outperform or hold their value compared to whatever the rate of inflation is. Naturally, that's been gold for as long as I've researched uh, uh, in investing. It's always been gold. I can't imagine a time where interest rates start to rise again. So I, I know that's coming, but I can't imagine a time where interest rates are rising, inflation is kicking up, and people are saying, they're, they're running away from the stock market and they're saying cryptocurrencies are going to hold their value. The reason that All right, mate, that's, that's a lack of imagination then because I, I think we might be in for a bit of that. <laughs> I can't imagine that time is because we've seen in less than five years this asset class that's supposed to hold its value. We've seen it go down 80%. We've seen it go down 50%. And this is just in a matter of four years. How can a serious investor trust that as an asset class to hold value? And Ryan, you sent me $5, five US dollars worth of Bitcoin cash. Let's say I was a business and uh, you uh, were my supplier and you paid me in Bitcoin cash. Uh, all of a sudden you paid that $5 in USD to me. Uh, now I'm holding $2.50 or $3.00. Uh, worth of that product that you uh, paid me five dollars for so how that holds value or how uh, companies can hold this on their balance sheet and think that it would beat inflation when the volatility is so high that that business might not survive six months if there is a huge correction in this space and you're stuck holding these assets that that are, are way too volatile the reason uh, the current system works is because the entire world trusts the U.S. dollar. Uh, the U.S. dollar was taken off the gold standard. And I know there, there's a lot of talk that fiat currency now is it's worth what you think it is worth. But at the same time, when the entire world adapts as, as its own currency, uh, it's worth a lot more than any other uh, virtual, any other uh, uh, limited supply, any, any other asset class that has, I don't care what it has, it, it's not being used as, uh, as a currency for the whole world, at least not yet. And I'm not saying the Bitcoin won't or Bitcoin cash. I can see a case more for Bitcoin cash than Bitcoin, but I'm, we're not going to get into that. You Love it. Love it right here. Look at this. This is amazing. This is uh, great. Great to hear, you know, and this is for as a side point for everybody who is listening to this podcast, obviously already on the crypto train. This is the evidence right here, right? Uh, Bitcoin, it's in a bubble. It's become this weird circle jerk of people inside the crypto sphere who think Bitcoin is where it's at. But if you just listen to somebody who's outside the, the whole hype cycle, they could see Bitcoin cash has utility and Bitcoin doesn't. And that's why it might be uh, taken over. So big, big ups to Moki here. Uh, at, least, at least he knows about the flipping, even if he doesn't <laughs> know about the rest of the crypto world know way more than me about that. But I'm, I'm saying is people are not going to be willing to trust in times of high inflation when the tech uh, sector starts to go down, when the stock market starts to go down. They're not going to trust something that they've, they can look to the past, even though it's a short past and they can see volatility 
through the roof. They're going to want something a lot more secure, something more like gold, something more like inflation protected bonds. Right. So, so unfortunately, when the volatility dies down and all the Bitcoin having cycles are done and all the big 21, 21 million Bitcoins are mined, uh, the opportunity will no longer be to create mass amount of wealth like we've been doing for the last 10 years. Uh, so that kind of just plays into being a little forward thinking and, and not actually being looking backwards because every great uh, every great civilization that has used a paper currency has failed. And uh, and every and it's also somewhat unique that every hundred years uh, the government or sorry the world tends to change its um, reserve currency. Uh, Bretton Woods brought on the United States uh, as the reserve currency, and before that it was the British pound. Uh, and I think you'll see something similar uh, in the next ten to twenty years. I don't think the dollar will will keep its reserve world currency, and I think it will almost better serve the world if it wasn't a monolithic power holding it. There would probably be more peace if it was a more decentralized network and not any one power having the reserve currency to rule over the other um, uh, world powers. So I, I really think Bitcoin is a, is a case for peace. I think it's a case for uh, ending war, making it harder for governments to tax their people. Uh, because if you can't fund war without uh, either taxing your people or inflating their currency. If you make it harder to inflate their currency, then you have to tax them. And what we saw when it was harder to print money during World War II, we actually used bonds, government war bonds people bought, because and they actually had to vote for the war with their dollars. And you, one could say that could be a more just war. So I think it'll be, cryptocurrency can make the world a more peaceful place in terms of um, a hegemonic power ruling the currency and by not making it so easy to rule a military industrial complex and invade other countries. And, and last thing I'll put into that, is uh, I think there's a, there's a real opportunity to bank the unbanked. Uh, many of the world does not even have a bank. That's a huge opportunity. And we see in the world right now when people first get their most you know food, water, basic supplies, uh, they want access to the internet. They want a phone. Phones are cheap now. And you have something like Starlink that wants to put low hanging si uh, satellites into outer space. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity to get everyone the ability to store value and transact it back and forth. And the volatility argument is um, is certainly one for those people, but one I think that will be solved by more market adoption and the Bitcoin having cycles no longer uh, having such an effect and shock to the supply chain. Okay, comments on uh, on crypto's usability. I know that's something that yeah that you talked about before. It, it's not going to stop world wars. I know that for a fact. I mean, I think uh, people have always been fighting for power. They've been fighting for land. Crypto is virtual. There's no way it's going to stop people from wanting to take land over. I came from a country where um, we had a civil war. So, I'm, you know, it's pretty, pretty familiar with with how power works within countries. And I'm not just saying the United States, when the country that I came from, but we see it even in the news today. People have fought since the since man was alive. So they're not going to uh, that not going to solve any kind of world uh, war problems. But what it, what I think. Well, yeah, I mean, this definitely remains to be seen. I guess the argument for cryptocurrencies isn't that it will totally eliminate conflict and people everywhere will just be happy and sing Kumbaya so much as if you take away the ability for state powers who are by and large the ones initiating and involved in wars to invisibly tax their population and they have to get those same resources because war is very, very expensive if they have to get those same resources directly from the population, well, the population will only stomach so much of that before they say, why are we spending all these resources on war? Why do we have troops invading overseas or whatever when they, we could have those resources uh, in, our, in our country? So I think, yeah, a little bit of a straw man there. I, I think maybe he mistook the point a little bit. Not that cryptocurrency will end wars, but that it will reduce the power for state actors to wage wars and that overall, that should be a good thing for humanity. But the point is valid that cryptocurrency is definitely not going to create world peace. Uh, Ryan, my biggest usability thing with that is the government, and you mentioned it here, is the people will get to keep it and the government will have a difficult time taxing it. I think anytime you play with the government, you try to take the government's money or try to uh, uh, get a benefit as far as not paying taxes, that's when the government will step in. Um, I think the government sat idle. I'm speaking of the U.S. government. I've seen and read reports 
uh, in, uh, with the Turkish government and now the Chinese government uh, sort of putting more regulations on Bitcoin and on crypto. But I think the U.S. government has stood idle and sort of let this thing run away from them. Uh, I don't see them doing that much longer with ETFs being created, uh, with this speculation running rampant and with this much uh, millions and now trillions of dollars kind of being traded around in this space. Uh, the government's going to want to make sure they collect taxes on this stuff. So that case that um, basically Bitcoin is going to be a way to uh, sort of get away from government collecting taxes. Uh, I think two things are certain, as we always say, death and taxes. Uh, we can't expect that uh, any government will sit idle and let something like this take over to the point where they're not going to be able to get the reins back in and, and make sure they get their hands on it. Um, and the last point, just on the... Right, well... Again, I think sort of maybe slightly misunderstood the point, which is that crypto doesn't necessarily... Well, crypto makes it easier to evade tax, uh, obviously, because people can, you know, trade around, use privacy-focused coins, this, that, and the other. And also, it's very hard to seize or confiscate uh, cryptocurrency for savvy investors who have you know, multi-sig wallets and all sorts of ways of, uh, you know, brain wallets, different things uh, of uh, protecting their wealth. So, it, it, but that's kind of beside the point of this argument. The the point really more being about the invisible taxation is that cryptocurrency, a limited supply um, currency especially, stops the government from taxing their population via inflation. They can still tax them directly, and I don't think Ryan... Or, or Moki are really just, dis, you know, disputing that point. Uh, but if they can't be invisibly taxed, that that changes the game quite significantly because people feel the effects of taxation much more when it comes directly out of their paycheck and they can see it on their pay slip than when it happens just bleeding away via, via inflation. So if there was Bitcoin Cash to take over the whole world or any uh, crypto, no, no country has the ability to push the money print button there any anymore and that's the that would be the inflation taxation that would be removed not the direct taxation the usability thing i just want to touch back on ryan i wanted to ask you a question about because i know you uh mentioned that companies like tesla and other companies are keeping this on their balance sheets just quickly answer for me this is again something i've been always wondering is if you're keeping it on your balance sheet um what happens when uh, this 80% crash happens that you're kind of predicting? Is that something that as a, as a business, these guys are supposed to time as well and get it off their balance sheets? Or are they going to be stuck holding something that corrects 80% and potentially bankrupts their company? I think like what you saw with uh, Tesla after the Q1 earnings, they made more money uh, by holding Bitcoin than they made in their company's history of ever selling cars. And they took profit. Uh, I think it'll be a very useful uh, tool to, to not only, I do think you would have to say there, and there'll probably be algorithms done to say how much we should keep on our balance sheet, what would be too much, what would be too little uh, to benefit as an inflation hedge. Um, certainly, I don't think, you know, there are some bad CEOs out there and there's some good CEOs. And I think we'll let the market, you know, treat it appropriately. And those people who understand the, the volatile nature of it and don't over allocate their balance sheet to it will benefit. And those who do, and need capital at those times could really hurt. Absolutely. Um, so that, that's, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it comes with responsibility. Absolutely. And uh, to, to touch on, like, I, I wouldn't, like, I don't think, I think maybe what I said got misunderstood. Like, I, I think the governments know they can't stop Bitcoin, right? So I, it's, again, there's a, there's a 10,000 nodes that exists in over 100 countries. What I'm saying is that they would, they have to make it, the way I want to put it is like if they want to attack crypto and make it like illegal to own or make it very difficult, they run a real risk of losing intellectual capital. They run a real risk of one of the most powerful technologies that's been created going away to another country, almost like the United States is a brain drain on other countries. We take their talent, we take their resources, bring it over here. It's almost a risk of a country being too uh, tough against it that they will lose uh, this growing trillion dollar asset class that's going to put you know, could potentially benefit trillions to the company's GDP. Uh, so that's why I, I, I don't think they will. They haven't treated it poorly because they know they can't stop it. And, uh, and I do think competing currencies will make them act better. Ryan, can you clarify, 
the tax comment you made because I don't want to misconstrue things. If you buy and sell cryptocurrency in the United States, you do have to pay a tax on it. So Correct. let's, I don't know if you would just want to clarify what you made because you said it was something along the lines of, you know, less able to tax it or I don't know, Moki said it. Moki well, I, I think, it. look, we're thinking about everything in American terms, right? Uh, because that's where we live. Uh, I'm, I think if you're living in other countries or other places, like people have to believe in the viability of the state and to exist and, and say, I will pay my taxes or, or if they don't believe in it, uh, they, they will look for an alternative way. If you're living in Venezuela and you're, you don't even put a price on something because inflation is so rampant in a day and, you know, cryptocurrency doesn't look that inflationary. And why would you want to pay taxes to a government that's destroying your wealth so viciously? Uh, you know, I think that they would act better because they have to compete for your interest and belief in their viability as a power. Uh, so generally for the world, but uh, but I think it will have probably lesser of effect in the United States because, again, we are live in a more privileged society. Thoughts on that, Moki? Yeah, my only thing with the U.S. is and in, in how they can stop crypto is you're buying crypto with U.S. dollars, right? Uh, the United States is the one that's issued those dollars. Uh, they can easily, you know. Get, get the financial institutions together and say, hey, any transaction going to these exchanges or going through these brokers ends uh, and they can eliminate the crypto space. I'm not worried about them doing that. I don't like I agree with Ryan. I think they don't want to lose that sort of uh, advantage of potentially having something that they can use themselves as an asset class. I just I mean, eh, interesting. Can the U.S. government completely ban Bitcoin or crypto? Yeah, I mean, for sure they can uh, they can uh, get the banks together and say, okay, we're going to shut down every U.S. exchange, every you know everything like that, and that would obviously be bad for crypto, and I'm sure it would have a devastating effect on the number of Americans that felt they could invest in crypto. But would it actually stop it? Probably not. I mean, if the U.S. can't stop cocaine <laughs> getting in and uh, being traded around you know, here, there and everywhere within its own borders. I don't see how it's going to stop crypto because the ultimate crypto exchange is is peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Which is that any one individual, anybody in America who was willing to trade cryptos, which they could get by any number of ways, they could work for it and earn it directly or they could, um, you know, trade it uh, if they were, uh, you know, uh, what, what's it called? Uh, a dual national citizen, right? They might get some overseas using their you know, money in their other country or their friends or family might send it to them or any one of a hundred different ways. Getting crypto is actually very easy and pretty much impossible to stop. And then trading it, it would just come down to uh, a bit of a street trade, right? Is that people would, you know, hand you over cash or they would send you a, a bank transfer and mark it as, uh, you know, be a payback for beers or something like that and you would send them some crypto off the books and and there you go the trade would just go that way instead of being happening on regulated exchanges so uh you know i mean that's already how it operates for instance in argentina with people trading the dollar against the local currency even though they're not supposed to it just operates on a bit of an informal basis like that so everybody agrees uh ryan and moki and myself that uh, the U.S. is unlikely to completely ban Bitcoin or cryptos, but even if they did, that would that would certainly diminish the trade, but it definitely would not put a hundred percent of a stop to it. I just worry that as as more countries get on board in in limiting um, how, how crypto can be used in their countries, like. China is is what I've been reading is they've advised their financials. Now, I'm not comparing the United States to China, uh, but they've advised their financial institutions uh, to basically not uh, use crypto. And, and I think that the more countries that do that and uh, the worse it's going to be for the crypto market, it can't be a good thing because it's going to limit market cap. And this whole idea of eventually once you get to all 21 million coins, that then it becomes less volatile and it becomes a store of value, I can jump on board with that idea because then I can say at least, okay, uh, all the mining stuff is done, everything's done, this is what's out there, this is what it's going to be worth now. 
Um, if volatility were ever to come down, I think governments would jump on board as using this as an asset. But I think the biggest asset behind this is not so much the cryptocurrency, but the technology behind, uh, behind the cryptocurrency. And that's what the governments and that's what I think United States financial institutions will start to adapt. And I don't know if they're going to call it crypto or whatever the heck they're going to call it. Uh, but it, it will do, uh, hopefully it will do uh, good things for, for, for customers and for people that, that use that technology going forward. I just don't believe that out of these 10,000 something coins that uh, any one of these really, uh, I know outside of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, uh, and, and those, I don't think any of these other ones will have any sort of place in our, in, in our society as far as actual uh, currencies or actual stores of value. I mean, a lot of stuff to unpack in that. So uh saying that once it gets to 21 million coins it would be more stable probably true but probably just because by that t time most of the world will be using crypto so or all of the world will be using crypto probably more accurately um so in that sense it would be more stable but that wouldn't you know that's going to come about long before the the 21 million coins very interesting side tangent there into uh, the technology behind Bitcoin, right? This is, it's sort of like a hanging over from the previous wave of sort of media FUD and hype, which was, there was this whole phase everyone went through of saying, I don't really believe in Bitcoin, but I believe in blockchain. You know, the technology is what's important and the technology is going to revolutionize everything. And I mean, that's such a red herring in my uh, mind because fundamentally the difference between, um, a blockchain and a centralized database is the distributed nature and the distributed nature is only operable because of the system of financial incentives tied to the mining network and so on and so forth. So a lot of uh, people have tried to make blockchain X or Y work for all these different things when really they should using a blockchain. I mean, it's a great buzzword that probably gets you a lot of VC investors but it's not actually fundamentally necessary when you could just use a SQL database like any other tech company would and that would solve your problem. The only time or, you know, for the most part, the need for a blockchain is when it is tied to a currency, when you have a functioning value transfer network and between any anyone in the world, right, it's open, it's got to be open to everyone. I've heard about these schemes of, people saying, oh, we've got to run a, a blockchain between our five companies or, or something like that, which is just nonsense. Like if you have those five companies, then fundamentally you're all agreeing to have access to it. And you could just set up a database that all your tech teams had access to and kept copies of, right? So uh, without the financial incentives of mining and so on and so forth, cryptocurrencies don't tend to last. So it is very important that the currency use case uh, is preserved in its utility but moki has obviously i don't know bought a little bit of the hype somewhere in there over the last few years that well it's going to be block blockchain but not bitcoin which is just the wrong approach entirely since the two are very very intricately linked to an extent that most outsiders uh, don't understand if you take away the financial monetary aspect to crypto well it's not really crypto anymore so uh, I think, yeah, you definitely need to have um, have that financial incentive and not think that blockchain is some great thing w once the currency aspect is uh, is removed. But he has mentioned again there, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, seems like those at least have got it made enough of an impact that uh, they're, they're likely to stick around. Uh, or anything that uh, will be around in the next 10 years uh, if the government doesn't get to them sooner by putting some sort of regulation, which I think is, uh, from my standpoint of view, I sleep better at night knowing that uh, uh, if Fidelity, my broker, shut down tomorrow, um, two and, uh, half a million dollars of my portfolio uh, will be transferred over to the next broker the next day. Uh, I think, Ryan, I don't know where where the majority of your portfolio lies, but uh, if you wake up tomorrow and that broker is out of business, uh, what happens to your portfolio or your crypto? <laughs> this, is a, this is a great point. I love this one because uh, Moki and I are just on opposite sides of the coin right there. He sleeps soundly knowing that one institution will transfer to another one. And I sleep soundly knowing that the laws of the universe and mathematics 
mean that my cryptocurrency is not going anywhere. So, <laughs> uh, I, I think, yeah, obviously the, the point in the middle, which is maybe where uh, Ryan falls for at least uh, some percentage of his crypto is having a crypto on uh, Robinhood or in a custodial account. And in that case, you've kind of got the worst of both worlds where uh, you're in the position where the government can seize it so you don't have cryptographic, uh, you know, backed blockchain security. But on the other hand, it's also not regulated or understood as well as a traditional bank account or the fidelity assets that Moki is talking about. So I think in this scenario, either either end of the spectrum is actually a valid point in the middle is where you want to watch out, right? If you've got crypto on the blockchain, you've got your private keys, you know what you're doing. That's that's very, very safe from getting, uh, I mean, obviously the value can be volatile, right? But the actual crypto disappearing entirely, very, very unlikely. Uh, and the same, I guess, with these fidelity backed accounts that, you know, the government isn't, except in very extreme cases, going to, um, you know, do anything about, uh, about those large, you know, hedge fund uh, indexes and so on and so forth. But in the middle, crypto in a custodial account, that's still, that's still a bit borderline. Cryptocurrency portfolio is something that I'm curious about too, because it's uh, difficult to say this um, builds wealth and stores value when, uh, in my opinion, tomorrow it can all be gone if, uh, if there isn't some kind of regulations and insurance behind it. I know there's private insurance uh, that, uh, that have started to come for, the, for a lot of these brokers, but there is no sort of government, governments that are regulating those. So what happens if tomorrow your quarter million or half million dollar crypto portfolio is wiped out? How do you get that back? Um, so something that, that I gave you, that, that Bitcoin Cash I sent you, uh, opened up a, a wallet for you that has a QR code. You can literally write that number, you can write that QR code down, you can remember that QR code, and you can carry massive amounts of wealth in your mind. No one has been able, never has wealth been able to be transferred that amount of wealth in such a way where you don't need a custodian. Part of the beauty of it is not needing or trusting a custodian. It's you having the ability to take responsibility and protect your wealth the way you see fit. Uh, you can send it to different portions of different QR codes all over the world and decentralize your wealth. You can you have the power of your finance. You're not trusting an institution like Fidelity or the stability of the American government or the Chinese so government. Who, or who are you trading your crypto with? Um, what do you mean? Or in terms of business, I, I, I encourage all my vendors to transact with me in it. I use it for a percentage of my business. I, I try to get, I, I give out as much crypto as I can to people. So they give it to me back and, and we transact that way. Uh, I believe tomorrow I'll do my largest company transaction in Bitcoin Cash ever of over $8,000. Um, and I, I want to be, and part of my business strategy is to acquire as much Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash as possible for the 20 Kicking ass here, Ryan. Great stuff. Really, really great to hear that uh, actual use of, of crypto uh, kicking off. But yeah, I think it's it's interesting that Moki has these questions because obviously he, he knows and he can understand that the exchange point between fiat and crypto is the, is the weak point. But maybe what he's not fully across is the concept that if you are acquiring crypto, especially if you're getting it like uh, Ryan's talking about directly from a trade and you are storing it on chain, that they're, they're kind of, you're, well, you're storing it with the blockchain, um, which just has obviously its own very unique method that because it's all uh, mathematical and uh, relies on, you know, storing your private keys, which don't need to be written down anywhere in the blockchain for the system to function. So you actually are not storing it with anyone, which is kind of a hard thing for people to understand coming from a mentality of like, let's say you want to go log into your bank account. Obviously your bank has the passwords, right? But the blockchain stores everybody's uh, Bitcoin cash wealth, but it doesn't store any of the private keys. which is a very unintuitive thing for people to understand. Um, but that, that's the case. And so I guess that's where Moki is probably a little confused. 2025 bull market, and I plan to retire at that time. Uh, or at least fire, in a way. I, I, like Dave in the discussion here, uh, recreational employment. And going into like the thesis real quick, I'll touch on it and why I mentioned like the possibility of that. 
and why I don't think the bull market in cryptocurrency is over the bull market, because uh, if it is over, this was a pathetic bull market. Uh, Bitcoin's first bull market, it went from $34 up to $1,100. It did a 34x return. Um, it never went back to its previous all-time high, never retraced from there. And then from $1,100, it ran all the way to $20,000, uh, roughly a 17x return. And then again, we never retraced a thousand dollars, and now we are we went from twenty thousand dollars. If we only three x, if we thirty four x the first time, seventeen x the second time, if we don't at least eight x, like I expect the volatility to die down. I don't expect seventeen x returns from Bitcoin. I expect at least an eight eight times return. Um, I think it's too cheap to sell your Bitcoin. I think, uh, and, and I think twenty thousand is a very solid floor. Uh, because again, we've never retraced our previous bull cycles, all time high. And it's very difficult to do because the amount of Bitcoins coming into circulation is now in half. All right. So we're getting a little bit lost in the weeds here with a lot of this discussion about the troll chart and the bubble cycles and when is it going to peak and crash. And so I think that's kind of missing the point. Obviously, this seems to be a very investment focused topic. So there hasn't been as much talk about uh you know nfts or smart contracts or even just retail adoption of cryptocurrency has only been mentioned in kind of in passing so i think things are getting a little bit lost in the weeds here in terms of when when people can sort of time the market and i uh in this case i'm the opposite uh to ryan where i think that maybe maybe the bull run is kind of a little bit over and that the trend of the bubbles is broken because in the previous bubbles it was to do with uh, the spreading adoption of crypto, but now Bitcoin is so handicapped, it's not really spreading in terms of, uh, you know, retail payments anymore. So I think this bubble might have kind of ended a bit, uh, a bit early. We're in a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a fantasy land a little bit um, with all the other currency shenanigans that are going on in the world, uh, as well as in the crypto markets. So who knows, uh, you know, I could be totally wrong on that. Sure, we could be going back to a bull run where crypto, you know, Bitcoin was going to go to $100,000 or, you know, $160,000 and 8x its previous all-time high. Maybe $60,000 was just a little small peak on the way. But I, I think actually probably Bitcoin's just going to stagnate a bit and then be in a bit of a, a decline while more useful cryptos like Ethereum and, and Bitcoin Cash rise up but that remains to be seen and either way uh, i think this whole scenario of uh, whether crypto is going up or down or whatever uh yeah they kind of need to get off that topic because the timing the market of, of crypto is sort of a little bit tangential to its fundamental viability over a 10 or 20 year period and it's trusting the rules of mathematics and not the whims of politicians is the argument for me Okay, I think uh, one of the common trends we've been seeing here, that at least if I can read your facial expressions, is every time Brian brings up something in regards to buying and selling at a specific time, right? Yeah. So talk <laughs> to us a little bit about why that's bothering you, because yeah, uh, I, I can mean, tell. <laughs> it, 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 man, it just def it goes against everything I believe. And I think, you know, I, I will admit here, you know, and I'm, I'm never hidden behind this. I have a bias, right? Like I... I I studied Jack Bogle's work and I have a bias towards um, in, investing. I, I, it's difficult for me to think, to set, I can't accept something that's this speculative as an investment. And to anybody, I just want to ask you, if you can honestly ask yourself, are you an investor or you're a speculator, right? And for me, an investor is a person who goes out, who buys businesses, whether you're buying them as individual stocks or you're buying them as a pool, like index funds. And then you have a long-term expectation. You're not worried about if that business is going to be viable in the next, you know, five months, 10 months. You have a long-term expectation that that business will continue to, to, to work and produce something, whether it's a service or a good, it's going to produce something. So it's going to spit something back uh, and, and over time its value will rise. If you invest in index funds, you're simply just saying, I believe if you invest in the S&P 500, I believe in America's future, Right. Every uh, crash, every since 1929, everything we've had, everything that America has overcome, um, America has been growing. So if you invest in an index fund, the S&P 500, you believe in that. If you invest in global diversification, you believe in the whole world. That's something that you can 
easily measure. You can calculate, you can measure. For me, specul speculation is betting on price. So I've, I hear a lot of different, well, it's done 30X, it's done 20X, it's done 17,000, it's done 30,000. That to me doesn't tell me the value of this. How is this value calculated? That just tells me what the price of this is. When I buy my index funds, I don't even look at the price of the index funds, nor do I know what the price of my index fund is because I simply don't care. I understand the value behind it. I understand the businesses that are building things, that are making newer technologies that I could have never imagined in my life. And 20 years from now, I'm assuming these technologies will be even more unimaginable. And I'm assuming these markets will be worth even more. Of course, I don't know that for a fact. I'm not saying, but if 20 years from now, America doesn't exist, neither will my index funds. I'll be okay with that. Uh, if 20 years from now, America is still plowing strong, my index funds are doing great, there's a huge possibility cryptos might not exist because they're not tied to the GDP currently of what America produces. It's our businesses that are tied to this. So my biggest, my biggest problem at the end of the day is the speculation. And I think uh, there, I'm not going to hide that. I think when you, when you speculate, it's going to lead you the wrong way. It puts a little bit of a, of a, of a, a cloud or sort of like a haze around you where you think the market only goes up. Now I know Ryan and you guys, and, and you Rich, you guys don't think like this. I'm just speaking on the average investor um, and what I've seen in the interactions I've had on my channel is people only think this stuff will go up. Um, and I like being a contrarian on the other end that says, hey, look at the time in history where this hasn't happened, whether it's the star fund manager, whether it's the, you know, the new big shiny thing, I don't care what it is. When you speculate on price uh, and you think that, uh, things will only go up. Unfortunately, uh, that will lead you astray and uh, things don't go up forever. We just have to kind of make peace with that. I'm, there's going to come a time where there'll be a country more powerful than America. That's why I have diversified index funds that own pretty much the entire globe. Even if it's a small percentage of it, uh, they own the entire globe. I can't think of a time where this type of asset class because I label this more as a commodity than anything else. I label this on the same level as gold, as precious metals, as uh, uh, something that doesn't produce anything. It's just simply just a commodity. Uh, I think uh, there won't ever be a time where the GDP uh, uh, or where a commodity like this will be such influential on the GDP of a country. I just can't imagine it. I could be 100% wrong. Uh, but that's really, yeah, Rich, where it comes from. I, I don't like speculating on price because I think it's just all air at the end. We're just talking. But if, if Ryan, you knew the price today, uh, or, or if you, like you said, with certainty, you have 70% certainty, uh, I think we would see trillionaires walking this earth if people knew uh, with that good of a certainty, that's where it was headed. Uh, there would be a lot, a lot more uh, people with a lot more money than, than what we have in this world today. Right, so this is great points overall here by uh, Moki Finance. Fantastic points. I actually uh, strongly agree with him on on most of that, not all of it. But uh, I mean, he is fundamentally saying, "Look, I can't." Crypto is mostly speculation, and that that is true. And obviously, the moderator picked up on the same vibes that I had. That he was getting too much in the weeds about the price being up or down. Um, what he's missing there, where and I mean, credit to him, he, he says, look, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. He's not on that Peter Schiff time of I'm right and I'm going to die on this hill. Uh, but uh, what he's missing is that the fundamental value will come from people adopting it as, as money. You know, if I needed to buy something from Ryan or Ryan needed to buy something from me, both of us would, would do that trading Bitcoin Cash without hesitation. Neither, neither of us are particularly interested in... Uh, United States dollars or British pounds or any other, um, you know, fiat currencies, uh, you know, we probably we wouldn't use uh, another crypto because we both like Bitcoin Cash, but I'm sure both of us would uh, prefer to trade in any crypto over any uh, fiat currency. And so or as, as if you can imagine that uh, the world, you know, that Ryan and I are in that position and so are a few other, you know, million people around the world, right? But as that spreads to be everyone, well, then that's the way that the, the world will transact. And in that way, if you had 50, 60, 100 percent of America trading in Bitcoin cash or even just cryptocurrencies generally, then, of course, the GDP of America would be tied to how that cryptocurrency was performing. 
uh, and and that's, it's really as simple as that. But uh, so far in this discussion, we've seen very little talk about the adop- the actual adoption for, for retail payments. Obviously, Ryan has said that he's been doing uh, some of that, and there's was a little bit of acknowledgement about some of that with Dogecoin. But for the most part, the, things have got off that topic, which is really where crypto is strong. And in the long game, that that's kind of what it's playing at, and that's where its value comes from. Uh, and being more focused on the the short term speculation. Sure, sure. Now, I do want to at least uh, reply to Kevin's response because it, it, he is right. Um, I do hold a lot of cryptocurrency on Robinhood, and a lot of that is because I started my channel talking about investing stocks and different things, and um, and it's very beginner welcoming. And and uh, I spent ten thousand dollars in a cryptocurrency on there as talking about as investment to relate to other investors. And it's just so happened to turn into $175,000. So, you know, when I do a portfolio review of like largest things, like I, I bought like at that time. And a lot of that money is money I plan to exit uh, the market with um, based on my thesis. And I think if you want to follow me and see if I'm right, uh, come ahead, go ahead. And if, and if I'm wrong, you can come and laugh at me. Uh, I do hold a lot in private wallets and, and I use that for transactions. And, um, and I think if you really want to like, go along with the market and you don't want to try to trade around it, like I'm attempting to do, you can put it into a cold storage USB drive and hide it somewhere and uh, protect it that way. And you can wake up in 20 years and and see how you did versus the stock market. Um, Index funds are fantastic. Uh, I do hold quite a bit of them and especially in like retirement accounts. Um, Like for me to to, like, like if I can't touch the money until I'm 60, uh, the rest of my wealth outside of that, I want to try to make massive amounts of wealth with, well, and outperform those things. So I, I'm, I'm totally for investing in index funds, but my, my challenge to myself, my personal hobby, I don't play golf, I don't do different things. I, I study about ways to outperform the broader markets. And, uh, and so far I've been able to do it. And what Moki did point out is correct. Uh, being contrarian in nature can be very friendly. And right now crypto is a crowded trade. And, uh, and, and when it was very low, that's what I was betting on, that eventually it would become a crowded trade. And I think Moki's right. Eventually, it won't be a crowded trade, and there will be the opportunity. But that, that the contrarian also plays well. And also investing in you know, diversifying, you can also diversify your investments, as Peter Lynch used to say. Like, <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're, you're protecting yourself against your own possible ignorance. And uh, and that that's good, but if you you are um, giving up an opportunity to to outperform, and like Moki said earlier, you can either get more wealth faster, or you can delay that process if you're wrong. It's a risk you have to be willing to take. Yeah, and for for those who are listening that are not familiar with cryptocurrency, the, the reason Ryan's kind of talking about Robinhood in that way is because you cannot currently on Robinhood you cannot take things like Bitcoin off of Robinhood and put it in cold storage. People call it like the IOU. Robinhood's been like, yeah, well, we promise, you know, that you'll be able to get it off off of our uh, our brokerage at some point. So other exchanges, <laughs> oh, you know, Robinhood's never are... lied to the investor, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they're known for their trust. So, um, yeah, but uh, that makes sense. Why that'd be more of the transactional one, or not transactional, but the ones that you would actually sell versus uh, keep in cold storage. Um, Ryan, or actually, let's go over to Moki real quickly. I just want to know what are your thoughts on things like gold and precious metals. Let's like play the old school yeah. Bitcoin, right? Like, what what do you think about that kind of stuff? I don't Bitcoin. think it has. I don't think it belongs in a portfolio. It goes back to uh, kind of what Ryan was touching on: is you have to. T- so yeah, I'm just going to jump in here because uh, before he says or Ryan says, I'm I'm going to get my thoughts quickly in here so we can compare. And one of the funny things uh, about uh, crypto is, uh, as we've seen with the Peter versus Spencer Schiff uh, debate, is that uh, Bitcoin and uh, or cryptos and gold are fundamentally quite aligned, but uh, people are on a broad spectrum in terms of whether they uh, like gold, like Peter Schiff, but then they hate crypto, whether they like gold and they like crypto, like uh Mike Maloney might be a, a good person uh, who falls into both of those camps or whether uh, they're like me and they like crypto and they don't really like gold or, or precious metals. I've got no problem with gold. I think it's better than 
the dollar in terms of long-term storing your wealth, but I think that crypto has essentially replaced any need for it. So I wouldn't be uh, particularly investing in precious metals at the moment. Uh, so in that way, it's a weird scenario where crypto people can offer, can be, not all of them, uh, can be very anti-gold in the same way as people who are anti-crypto are also anti-gold, right? So it's an interesting dynamic. So we might see here uh, Moki saying, you know, obviously started saying he doesn't really like gold and we'll get to see whether Ryan's take is that gold is a good hedge. Well, I'm going to guess he's going to say, okay, maybe uh, it'll be good to have a little bit, you know, just to spread around, protect yourself from government, uh, you know, inflation and so on and so forth but that ultimately it's not going to have the insane returns of crypto. So it's not good. So that's my prediction for what he'll say, but he might surprise me and just say, no, nope, I hate gold or actually like gold is the best. Take more risks to get a higher reward. And I completely agree with him. I mean, I'm not debating that, but the fact is, you know, people bring up these uh, gold and precious metal talks when there's a bear market uh, in, 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 Pretty much since 1929, I don't know how it was before then, but since 1929, you know, we experience uh, out of every 10 years, we experience two bear markets in the stock market. So to go into an asset class that underperforms eight out of the 10 years, just so you can be safe for two years, doesn't make any sense to me. So that's why I think uh, my biggest uh, reasoning for not wanting to get into crypto is because I believe it is a commodity, just like gold, just like uh, pretty much any of these other uh, asset classes that are used as a hedge when things go wrong in the stock market. Um, and I would never invest or advise anybody to invest in those types of asset classes that therefore I never invested on my, uh, myself. And am I at all sad that I missed the train? Absolutely not, because I don't uh, personally believe in it. And even if I did invest in it, uh, I think I wouldn't have the mental capacity or, or the risk capacity to hold it. Uh, the way Ryan holds it and the way you hold it, Rich, I, I'm not going to lie to myself. I don't have that type of risk capacity. Uh, it's not the way uh, I learned about investing. It's not uh, historically there has never been an asset class that has outperformed stocks. Um, you can outperform for a decade. You can outperform for, if you get really lucky, two decades. But to outperform businesses that actually produce something uh, with an asset class that doesn't produce something, I think is just, uh, it's... Um, wishful thinking, in my opinion, it, it really is. And uh, whether, you know, any bubble that's ever formed, I think uh, there's always been companies that rise from the ashes. There's always the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks uh, that rise. And I'm sure in crypto there will be as well. But we need to understand that this is going to be something that will probably be the likes of the internet bubble. They'll be the likes of what happened in 1929, uh, 1967, 68 with momentum trading and go-go era. Um, there's almost a decade every single time where interest rates get really low, people start running to other asset classes that are not stocks, and uh, they see great performance, but I have yet to find one, and you can correct me if you know of an era or a time where a different asset class has produced uh, better returns than the stock market since basically 1920s. So if I can interject, the only thing that matters in any asset is supply and demand. And uh, the reason that I maybe foolishly think I can predict bull markets in cryptocurrency is because we have a disruption in the supply chain. The same thing happens in, um, in gold and silver and in, in other commodity markets. But when the supply is, becomes too low, we must overpay people to bring this commodity to market. And right now, gold is just too profitable to mine. I think you can mine an ounce of gold for around $800. And while the price is at $2,000, there's still going to be too many profitable miners. We need miners to go bankrupt. We need miners to become, we need to become a really bad business to get in. And where we actually need this commodity more in the market, we will, we will be willing to overpay for this commodity. So while it's similar in nature in that way to, uh, to the crypto market, supply, and crypto's taught me a lot about that. Uh, and the bull cycles that have happened in, in, um, in gold and silver has been from a market when it was very, a very bad business to get into. There lied the opportunity when there were not enough miners. The same thing goes for oil and gas. If, uh, if, if it becomes the price of gas goes up so high and you have people going all over the world because they can profitably take, you know, pull oil out of the earth at $150 a barrel, there's going to be a flood of supply and then price will fall back down. That's why I actually make a case where I don't see anything really uh, from a market standpoint wrong with price gouging. 
because it'll bring supply to the market. So like during a hurricane here down in Florida, people will start selling a, a case of water for like $15. Well, that's telling the world, come and bring all the water here because we really need it. And then they will bring it because it'd be very profitable to do. But if there's a shortage, then there will be the opportunity. It's just simple economics. So I could be see myself buying precious metals in the future if it ever became a very bad business and there was a disruption in the supply chain. And that's why I'll be buying a lot of Bitcoin in 2024 to get ready for the disruption in the supply chain. Okay. okay. Thoughts on well, that? I got no okay. thoughts, man. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just, look, look, it goes back to, again, give me an asset class, man. Give me so, an asset class that there's some stock market over time. There's some, well, Bitcoin. There's <laughs> whoa, 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 no. Give me an asset. I said since 1920. Oh, hang on. You guys are misunderstanding. You guys are giving me four-year periods here. Give me an asset class since 1929. The beast. Well, it's a 10-year period, but let's just. There are some chirps in the chat, so let's just let's just get down to it. You, we talked about earlier. You mentioned something along the lines of, you know, I can't DCA into something that is up and down 40 percent in a month. You could, right? You could set up a weekly buy where you buy. $50 of Bitcoin every week, and you don't look at the price just like you do an index fund. Do you see any place for that in your portfolio where let's say you put $200 a week into, into index funds, taking $10 of that and putting it into Bitcoin a week? I'm just using random numbers here. You don't see that being useful in any case. Right. So glad to see this. The commentators on the live stream, obviously, uh, thinking along the same lines as me with my uh, earlier uh, comments. We've already seen Moki uh, Finance shaking his head a little bit here uh, during this question. Very, very good question by the moderator. So uh, interesting to see what his take is here. I don't. Um, Rich, to be honest with you, I have a, I have a philosophy that uh, if every person uh, followed something as simple as investing uh, in index funds, they would all reach millionaire status. Um, I don't, uh, I don't pay attention to anything outside of that. I, I stick to what I know, what I know best. I think um, I understand. There's always going to be newer and better things, and maybe I'm a hundred percent wrong on this. If I if I could afford to put freaking a couple of hundred bucks a month away into a, into uh, uh, crypto investments, but I always look at opportunity cost uh, and what I can control. Uh, a lot of the stuff I can't control, the stock market I can't control. Uh, I can control how I diversify. I can control uh, what I think my expected return will be over a 20, 30 year period. I can get that to an accuracy rate of probably 95, 98%, somewhere around there. Of course, there's always that unknown. And any investment, there's gonna be a great unknown. Um, because if it wasn't, it wouldn't pay a premium, right? If, if, if you want something safe and secure, sit in cash, keep it in a bank, uh, and you'll have your 50000 of course, minus inflation. So even that's not secure. But at least there's, you eliminate the great unknown there. Uh, for me, with the crypto space, it's so early on that the, uh, the great unknown exceeds whatever uh, profits that I can uh, come up in my head. And uh, I know you guys were early adapters and you got in at, at great low prices. For me... At, at these prices, I would almost feel like I'm chasing the market, the crypto market. I'm chasing something that has run away from me. Um, and if I wouldn't have invested in it back in 2017 after it crashed. And, and a little secret, I did own Bitcoin back in my speculative days. So I'm not uh, here to say that I've never invested and in I have invested in it. Uh, I've, I've owned Bitcoin after uh, in 2018, I bought Bitcoin at 3000 and I got out at nine or 10,000, something like that. So that was, again, me before I uh, embraced index funds, before I embraced uh, passive investing, before I embraced something that works so well that you could do it with your eyes closed. Um, wow. So yeah, a bit of a twist in the tail there. Uh, <laughs> the fiat, uh, you know, uh, side of the argument being in, in on the Bitcoin and out in the, uh, I mean, even at the start of the talk where he said, uh, he doesn't have any of his own money in it. Uh, interesting that it then emerged, okay, well, maybe now he doesn't accept that bit that uh, Brian gave him, but that he bought it in there. And, you know, funny enough, uh, I kind of wonder how he went about it and did it because uh, obviously getting involved in 2018, that was after the split from Bitcoin Cash in 2017. So at that time, the narrative wheels were already grinding away for Bitcoin to be a 
commodity, digital gold, buy and hold, all this crap, right? And none of the actual, oh, it's going to be a currency that people can spend and trade with and so on and so forth. So it seems like he picked his moment and uh, well played, you know, hats off that he got in and out at the right time. But I'm fascinated, uh, as I've seen with my uh, going to meetups recently in, in London, that because of that huge shift in the narrative um, at the time of the, the fork and with Bitcoin being the market leader, that so many people involved in cryptocurrency see it as a speculative asset or a commodity and not as a currency or a form of money. Uh, and I think things are going to swing back that way as Bitcoin Cash kind of rises to prominence and as more and more people get comfortable with it, more and more people are going to find that it's easier to, to make daily trades because there'll be more people around you willing to willing to do that kind of thing. But it's it's funny that uh, Moki Finance obviously got involved and uh, you know made some uh, dollar gains and everything. But people can get involved peripherally in cryptocurrency and not kind of get to the core of it, like that it is actually a revolution in in money in day to day transacting. But I guess that's just not apparent uh, because that that in many parts of the world. Uh, probably in almost nearly all parts of the world, that's not easy to just see in front of you. But obviously, as people start to see that, it will start to take off. And by then, uh, the a lot of the opportunity to have made uh, outsized returns on it will have uh, gone away. So obviously, Moki has his uh, philosophy that he wants to do what is easy and lowest risk. Fair enough. Um, you know, that's certainly one approach you can take. But uh, obviously with low risk comes low returns and uh, discounting the the unknown of the future so heavily and not making any stab at, well, I think this might go this way. You know, it seems odd that he wouldn't think, okay, maybe there's a, a 1% chance that Bitcoin keeps going up and then put, you know, 1% of his assets into it. He was talking about the opportunity cost. Well, the opportunity cost of not owning cryptocurrencies is very, very high. And the opportunity cost of owning them is very small if he only wants to put in a small asset percentage. So in, in that sense, it's uh, another point where his own argument, I feel, doesn't really stack up uh, against itself. Uh, because clearly he's smart enough and he knows enough about it to understand that this probably isn't going away. And it, it, there is not zero value to the thing in its entirety. Yeah, he, he's correctly also identified there's a lot of shit coins and whatever, but he's got the, he's got the right idea that a few of the big ones are going to pull through and be a big part of the future. So I don't know why, you know, even assessing the chance of that, he might put in some small allocation, but it seems like it's index funds all the way. And ever since I started embracing that, I have stopped looking for other ways to outperform. Not that it's impossible. And I think Ryan, you will outperform. You've already shown us that you can outperform and I'm never going to doubt that. And you too, Rich. But uh, I think the probability of outperforming is so low and the more people that get into it, the lower that probability drops. So then you're going to have a lot of people that end up underperforming. Um, we've seen it with ARC funds. We're going to see it with the crypto market. We're going to see it with Bitcoin, all these other coins. As the, uh, as the volatility, in my opinion, starts to heat up even more, uh, drops of 20, 30% will scare the average investor out of this stuff. Uh, you can hodl all you want, but there's going to be people that are selling. That's why this thing is dropping 20, 30%. That's going to open up to a lot of speculation, manipulation. And it's going to open up to the average person who I'm talking to right now, who's hopefully watching this live stream. It's going to open up to them losing a lot of money when here they could have just invested in something that was not necessarily safe, uh, but something that had uh, more of a track record, more of a history, and something that you can actually calculate intrinsic values on and say, hey, um, this is why this is worth this much. And I want to add to what Moki said there is that some uh, Peter Lynch, one of the best investors in Wall Street history, wrote a book everyone should read called One Up on Wall Street, ran the Magellan Fund for, I believe, around 12 to 15 years. 13 somewhere years. Around there. And he returned investors 39% annually, crushing other funds. But did you know that the average investor that invested with him only made 7%? People are bad investors. People invest with their emotions. People do not look at broad, they don't try to be contrarian in ways. They, they chase things that are shiny object syndrome. My videos about cryptocurrency in the bear market got very little views. My videos now in the bull market get a lot of views. It's not good. Um, 
So I think you have to really mature as an investor if you want to get into more, uh, especially if you want to try to outperform. It's, it's not easy to do. It, um, it, you, you have to endure extreme uh, volatility. I, I saw over six figure swings in my portfolio just this weekend. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, you have to, uh, it, it's, it, it's not for the lighthearted and you really have to have it. It's not for everyone. And, and I'll definitely say that, and, but if you want to and you enjoy it and, and, you, and you find a passion, see for me, I'm lucky, like my two biggest hits in investing in the last, you know, high conviction plays that have allowed me to outperform was going after crypto in the bear market. It was going after Tesla when it was 200 pre-split or around $50 when everyone thought it was going bankrupt. But yet I saw, saw them selling massive amounts of cars and at a nice gross profit margin. Uh, so there lies the opportunity. I, I, I don't, from an investing standpoint, I don't think everyone should necessarily rush into it now. They should have some kind of uh, philosophy into it. And, uh, and I do really believe and cryptocurrency for a lot of humanitarian purposes uh, that will help um, diversify against tyrannical control, manipulation of currency. And, uh, and I do think it's a net positive for humanity. I think the <clears throat> cryptocurrency and Bitcoin conversation in countries where inflation is rampant and their government is just can't be trusted is, is a whole other one that can be had. And I'm sure Moki could even find common ground on that for sure. Absolutely. Um, but I did see, I think I saw some beads of sweat rolling down Moki's face when uh, Ryan said six, you figures, six man. figure swing Dude. in one weekend. Dude. <laughs> you know how hard I worked for six figures, man? <laughs> I worked, I didn't work very hard for mine. Yeah, well, that, again, <laughs> the market did the work. Yeah, no, no, I understand. I understand. I'm saying how hard I had to work with, with the market and, and my index funds to make six figures. No, man. <laughs> That's a quality point. Some good, some good banter there, but you know, it really just goes to show, like, you know, if you want to, uh, if you want to make the big bucks, you got to kind of swim with the sharks, right? So, Ryan's in there making ridiculous crypto gains, but he's also, you know, suffering on the downside when it, uh, it all crashes out, and uh, obviously, yeah, that that kind of volatility is not. Uh, not for everyone, but the uh, the classic uh, crypto line is don't invest more than you're willing to lose, or as I like to think of it, don't invest more than you understand about cryptocurrency, basically. So when you get into it, just put in a small amount. It'll be insanely volatile. You get the idea. Do your reading, listen to this podcast, listen to other podcasts, you know, whatever. Go out, trade, go to meetups, find out what's going on in the world, uh, and then, you know, invest uh as you are at, at a level you are comfortable with that's that's my non-financial advice uh, that's that's my philosophy anyway and i agree with you it, i think we, we're finding common ground we see that uh, and I'll, I'll give some i'll speak some things you guys maybe didn't know about me i was in tesla early too but i got out at the wrong time so you can see why i'm not for market timing and speculation because i always get it wrong um, and I'd rather admit that and, and have that be a fault of my own. And I think um, admitting that gave me the ability to endorse, uh, endorse index funds and embrace them to the point where I've never had better returns um, and I haven't had to uh, worry or sweat the volatility that other uh, investments uh, when I was younger and, and being invested in individual stocks or uh, high growth spec plays did all that volatility, all that created was sort of, I felt like stress that I didn't need in my life and index funds really simplified everything for me. Um, it allowed me to, uh, three X my wealth really quickly, um, faster than, than I would have imagined. But of course we've been in the greatest bull run, uh, when it comes to the stock market and even what happened in March of 2020 is nothing uh, to a crash that could be a lot bigger than that 50, 60% like we've seen in the past. So I'm not going to uh, say that this will continue with the stock market, but uh, just to touch back on, I cannot see myself losing a thousand dollars in this. So I can't imagine losing six figures or not losing. I shouldn't say losing. I can't imagine a six figure swing. Um, and not, I don't want to get personal or into net worth or anything, but even if my net worth was $10 million, I can't imagine seeing, uh, a six figure swing in my portfolio. It's not, I, I wouldn't be able to handle it. And I'm, you know, willing to admit that. And 
I think you, Ryan, too, will agree that most people, I don't know maybe if I'm not the majority in this, but most people wouldn't be able to handle it either. And unfortunately, they would make the wrong decisions, uh, decisions that I've made before as a well-educated investor versus what these new investors are doing with no uh, research, no convictions, basically um, reading something on a forum, on a Reddit, on a tweet, and kind of going in there blindly. I think my end goal with all this, um, whether the cryptocurrency does well or not, doesn't really matter for me. I'm not invested. My end goal is to try to save a lot of people from losing money and buying uh, into assets that are highly speculative and buying at the worst possible times. Um, and if if I can reach one person and stop them from doing that, maybe I, I ruin their uh, future and, and maybe I save them a bunch of money. So um, that's all I got to say on it. Uh, I just, for me personally, there's no way in heck I can handle it. Um, and I'm willing to be man enough to admit that. And I think that's fine as long as you know what you can handle. I've talked to uh, investors that can't handle uh, a 60% stock position. They need to be 80% uh, bonds or 60% bonds. And uh, I, I, I say, great job. You figured out what you can handle. Um, of course, uh, they know they're going to have lower returns. And I'm not going to sit here and say that, uh, you know, seeing something run up 300, 400% while my index funds are doing, you know, 20, 40% uh, doesn't kind of make me think, oh, what if, uh, but at the same time, uh, what ifs don't do me any good. Um, I know this is where my safe zone is. This is what will keep me invested long term, and this will help me get to uh, to the status that I'm going. I think me and you, Ryan, are both on the same sort of uh, trajectory. We want to retire early and buy our time back and be able to do what we want with our investments. And I think... Um, we're taking two different approaches to getting there, not just with our investments, but in the way we treat and look at money. I know we've talked before about you kind of using debt as a, as, as a tool to help you get further along and leveraging it. And of course, I'm anti-debt and 100% cash. So you could probably see where I'm not going to be a Bitcoin uh, uh, a lover either when I'm uh, so committed to, to, to physical cash and the U.S. dollar and buying things in in cash. So um, I, I've had a lot of fun tonight, man. I think you've opened up my eyes to... Um, to possibly all right just before we get into that it looks like they're starting to wrap it up there's only five minutes left on the video but uh yeah big ups to uh moki on this one yet again another uh set of great points you know it is true uh one of the most important things you know know thyself right so everybody needs to make the the right decisions for them and and everybody is different right so if he's not somebody that that can handle or enjoys that kind of volatile aspect uh, to cryptocurrencies, then it's good that he understands that and, and that he's not involved. And obviously, he's aware that he's speaking to a, a very conservative um, crowd, you know, in terms of people that follow his advice. And that's uh, obviously a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because because he had that kind of advice, more conservative investors would be drawn to that and appreciate listening to that. And then it sort of uh, builds on itself in a uh, in a cycle, right? Uh, whereas for Ryan and I, it's going to be the opposite, right? It's going to be more targeted to people that are willing to <laughs> be a bit on the fringe or ahead of the game and uh, going with the volatile uh, cryptos. So, yeah, i got to say, you know, hats off really to uh, Moki on this one that uh, he's, he's not saying that crypto is not going to work out, just that it's not for him. And while eventually it will be for him, uh, you know, down the road once it is more stable or once he's seeing it used absolutely everywhere and he understands that it's not going anywhere and it's going to be uh, adopted or he can see it being traded for real goods and services in his local area. Uh, and that will be, you know, should be convincing uh, at that stage. By that time, he'll also be able to invest in it and not have uh, insane volatility and have it be, uh, have it be safe. So, yeah, you know, that's, uh, I got uh, no beef with that. That was, that was some great points. Maybe down the road, if I see it uh, profitable enough to maybe put away a couple of, couple, couple of dollars into, uh, into something like Bitcoin Cash. That's the only one that I'm honestly still seeing as, as a big use case. Uh, you really opened up my eyes when you, when you sent me that five bucks and uh, really opens a world of possibilities of how easily we can send money to one another uh, within really milliseconds and um the only other thing i can say on it is yeah amazing great great work here by uh ryan and i think this is the biggest ringing endorsement this is music to my ears this is what i love to hear right which is that 
for somebody like Moki who knows that, okay, crypto is very um, speculative and, you know, there's obviously a lot of hype and he, he's smart enough to know, look, I'm going to stay away from that if I don't understand exactly what's going on. But Ryan sending him Bitcoin Cash, you know, it's just money. It's as simple as that, right? And how easy and frictionless and low cost it is. It's very easy for people to understand the real utility to that. And that's at the end of the day when all these other co coins go bust or irrelevant in 10 or 15 years. That's why cryptocurrency, you know, is still going to be here in the form of uh, Bitcoin Cash, you know, following it on its rise to global reserve currency. And maybe that's something that uh, Moki can uh, get on board with, even if uh, he and I agree that <laughs> most of crypto is uh, speculative bullshit, basically. <laughs> is the cost. Um, I know the transactional costs for that are really low, but uh, costs to actually own this as an asset class are still high. And if uh, Jack Bogle uh, still would see these costs of uh, something like coin, uh, uh, is it Coindesk or Coinbase? I forgot the name of them now. Coinbase. They're charging, Coinbase, they're charging like uh, 50 basis points for transactions under $10,000. Uh, that doesn't do anything good for the individual investor if you're heavy into speculating and buying and selling. It's really the middleman that's making out there. Uh, you know, traders can trade between one another, and that's what makes up the market. But the difference is the the person in the middle who's uh, getting those transactions. They're the one that are actually making the money, while the traders are kind of just trading back and forth. So I think if costs can come down, uh, and I'm sure as as more people start to use it and it becomes more secure, it could. But uh, for now, I don't I don't see myself probably within the next four or five years getting into 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 uh holding this as an asset class so again i want to touch on the fact that um that in this time in the market and, and certainly if i'm right and we go much higher we're going to need more voices like moki to save people from themselves uh, i don't think it should be a government force i think it should be in a voluntaristic way by people offering thoughts and opinions in the market and um and the best time to buy crypto was last year this is not the best time to buy it do I think there's some more juice to squeeze out of this thing? Sure, but your your level of uh, risk is much higher, and you have to be willing to accept that. So I, I definitely appreciate uh, Moki's contrarian view. Uh, that's where I made most of my money was being contrarian, and um, and I, I so I I really appreciate the debate, and I haven't heard from a bear in a while, and uh, and and I really thought it was a good idea to do this at this time, especially after the crazy market volatility that we had and hopefully bring more light to this asset class to people that are watching and listening and hopefully they found value. And if you guys found value, please let you, let me know what you found interesting in the comment section. Uh, and Rich, I really appreciate you, you hosting the event. Yeah, we couldn't have thought of a better host. Um, you do a great job of your podcast and hopefully we can bring more traffic and awareness to what you're doing by highlighting people like me and Moki that are out here trying to um, encourage people to, uh, to not be consumers in a way and try to delay gratification into assets that can improve their lives and hopefully improve the world. Yeah, I love it. I think uh, both you guys wrapped it up nicely. And Moki, you, you put it best when you said, you know, both you guys have the same goal, right? It's just taking different paths to get there. And we can't tell what's going to happen. I mean, we'll just have to look back in 20 years and, and see. And odds are, just having the mindset that, that we're even having right now, talking about this on a random Monday night, but both you guys are going to be very successful uh, just doing it your own way. So uh, again, I said at the beginning, but these guys actually reached out to me to do this uh, on my channel with significantly less subscribers than they have. So they're getting uh, less uh, viewers than they would probably get on their channels, but doing me a solid by trying to get people out there. I was actually thinking about this today. I don't think I've ever asked ever on my podcast for somebody to subscribe so if you guys feel like subscribing feel free to go <laughs> hey, ahead stop that subscribe to this <laughs> all right channel. what are you talking about you feel like <laughs> i'm in there with a sub uh i've loved this this is this has been great i'll offer my closing thoughts in a second just uh let's wrap up the video hey subscribe. i'm all about free will man let people do what they want so there's Hey, there's Moki Finance private members in here, guys. You better hit the subscribe button on the retreat <laughs> room and send me a screenshot that you did it. I appreciate it. I, that, this is why I like to have walked around with my posse, right? You guys are just going to strong arm, strong arm them into uh, making, making them subscribe. So it's good. <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I really appreciate the debate and got to share a lot of 
thoughts and feelings towards it. And it'll be really interesting to see where this market goes forward. And I hope everyone trades safe. And, and, and Moki, I got to say, like, uh, I, I really respect and appreciate what, you, what you've done. And I think you've brought light. And it's amazing. I mean, you've really uh, grown your channel uh, very well. And, and I think you'll uh, benefit a lot of people. And, and you obviously are. I mean, how, how quickly you've grown, man. And, and, um, and, and thank you for, for doing this. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thank, thank you as well. Uh, just one final thought here is, guys, um, don't listen. And hopefully uh, what I always say on my channel as well is don't listen to this uh, podcast or live stream and make any kind of sudden changes based off what me and Ryan said. I think we each have our own beliefs. Uh, that should not be the same belief you adapt to. Come to your own conclusions. And uh, uh, Rich, thanks for having us. Ryan, uh, keep killing it with the crypto, man. I I got nothing to say. You're the goat, man. <laughs> you're the goat. Hey, I'm just uh, I'm just along for the ride and the entertainment value, and uh, you're kind of living through you because there, there's no way I'd be able to do it. Hey, you got two dollars of Bitcoin cash. I, I'm still <laughs> I'm still holding. I'm still tomorrow moon. might be a dollar. We don't know. <laughs> All right, guys. Appreciate it again, and uh, have a great week. All right. Good night, guys. All right, and that will do it. So, yeah, overall, uh, I've got to say, yeah, very high quality content, uh, a great debate. Um, I think overall, you know, it, it was it ended up being more of a discussion more than a, a debate. Perhaps there wasn't. I mean, it started out there wasn't even necessarily a thesis point, and nobody's really uh, keeping score or anything like that. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I've got to you know, uh, once again, take my hat off to Moki. He did a very, very good job of uh, the, essentially the less tenable opinion in my, in my mind uh, of, of repping kind of uh, the issues of, of cryptocurrency. And notably, he did that not by saying that it's all a scam, it's not going anywhere or anything like that, but just trying to warn people that they should be very careful in that marketplace. They should do their own research um, for investors who have a low risk tolerance. You know, obviously they shouldn't be over allocating into it. That right now it's probably you know overvalued for its relative real world value. All of those things are true. So really, really great points um, by him. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've got to got to respect that. I was coming into this. I was expecting a lot more. Peter Schiff style uh, denialism that is sort of easily uh, dismantled, but you know he did have a very uh, reasonable and and uh, rational uh, position, which was more that not that crypto is not going anywhere, just so much that it's not for him, or it's not for him at this uh, time. And I think maybe if he uh, starts trading in it, you know, or he starts sending it around with Ryan a little bit more. Maybe he'll he'll get the idea, you know, if the supermarket down the road starts uh, accepting Bitcoin Cash or something. Especially as he said, he really likes physical cash. Uh, Bitcoin Cash definitely could appeal to him, and it makes sense that he got out of Bitcoin because he correctly identified that as having turned into a complete speculative uh, bubble mania. Then for Ryan, you know, did a, did a good job uh, repping cryptocurrency. I really would have liked to see a bit more focus on the kind of idea that it will be adopted for payments and that everybody in the world will start to transact with it. The things obviously got caught up a lot in in the price and in the volatility being kind of the main main topics. I, I think it would have been really good to see a bit more, you know, sort of in the long run, let's say over 10 or 15 years, is it likely that, that people will start to be trading cryptocurrency just regularly instead of fiat currencies? And the answer is probably yes. And uh, I don't mind so much that there were, it didn't really get into smart contracts and um, NFTs and all those other kind of ancillary stuff in, in crypto. That's that's a bit of a sideshow, to be honest. So, you know, it very could have easily derailed into, into a lot of sort of nonsense about that. Um, and so I'm glad that it didn't, didn't kind of go uh, that way either. But yeah, overall, really high quality debate. I enjoyed it. Uh, Rich did a great job of, of moderating. His channel is The Rituation Room. I'll put a link to it in the, in the description. Uh, I'll be interested 
you know, I'm, I'm sure Ryan will probably check out this uh, video, but I'll be interested to see uh, if Moki Finance or, or Rich uh, have a bit of a listen. Maybe, maybe they would be interested in my commentary. Uh, I don't know. But overall, great, great, uh, great content. And I, I did really enjoy uh, watching that and hopefully everyone enjoyed my review. So, oh, one last thing that I had to say as well is as usual, shout out to the uh, donators. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate all my uh, donators. Slides and resources are at www.bitcoincashpodcast dot com uh, links to recommended resources and so on and so forth um, for you know not just from me but from a whole range of people that are really good about cryptocurrency uh, and shout out this week goes to uh, the people I met at the the meetup last weekend so I did a second meetup and there was a, a few people there that had been there before and a, a new crowd, it was about 50-50 of, of people that came back for the second round and uh, some that hadn't been there the first time. Uh, and yeah, it was just great chatting to everyone. And, and once again, you know, crypto is really uh, spreading about quite a lot, <laughs> I would say at the moment. So yeah, shout out to everyone I, I chatted to there. I know a couple of you subscribed to the podcast and hopefully you enjoyed. All right, cool. That, that'll do it then for real. Uh, until next time. He pulled out his laptop and rang up the site Looked at me and said, this will change your whole life Then he started explaining the basics to me The miners make money by taking the fee Every time a transaction is made incomplete And they work every minute and day of the week A guy named Satoshi created this all He's the mastermind of it, the brain in the ball There's a lot more to say, but before I begin Just tell me right now if you're out or you're in